Mangroves and Murder, an Enchanted Coast Magical Mystery, Enchanted Coast Magical Mystery Series, Book 5, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Megan Kelly. Chapter 1 Here you go, Fiona, I said, sliding two margaritas across the bar to the Gorgon, who was a regular at the resort. I'm sorry for all the chaos. It's spring break, and for some reason, we got an influx of college kids this year. I had to raise my voice three decibels just so she could hear me apologize over the blaring jukebox and the rabble-rousing group of werewolves celebrating nearing the end of their post-secondary educations. I flicked my wrist toward the source of the music and turned it down, then wished I could do the same to the group when they booed me. She gave me a patient smile. Don't worry about me. I feel bad for you. I've seen what you've gone through for the past week, and I wouldn't wish that on my enemies. Well, not on most of them anyway, and that's coming from a woman who can turn people to stone. You're a saint for putting up with such a hot mess without casting a single curse on any of them. I returned her smile, and for the first time that day, it was genuine. Believe me, it's entered my mind a time or two. These are on the house. We're just glad to see you, and thank you for taking it all in stride. She waved me off, and the tips of her expensive bedazzled nails caught the sunlight streaming in through the fronds of the tiki. Don't think anything of it. We've been coming here since you opened, and rarely do we have anything to worry about like this. Like I said, I just feel bad for you guys. She shoved a $20 bill across the bar and gave me a final wave as she turned toward the table she and her friends had commandeered by the infinity pool. As I watched her leave, a foam football zoomed across the bar and smacked me in the shoulder. I ground my teeth and did my best not to sling it back at whoever threw it. I did, however, throw up a barrier that would allow us to pass drinks and whatnot across the bar, but wouldn't let anything enter it. I wished I'd thought to do it hours ago. Dude, I'm so sorry, a surfer boy werewolf said, giving me a fake thousand-watt smile as he held out his hand for the ball. I was sure that worked on 99% of the male-loving population he turned it on, but I wasn't in the mood. That was about the tenth time it had happened, and he was about one condescending comment away from having it surgically removed. I returned the fake smile, and I not so gently thrust the ball back across the bar at him. If you were sorry, you wouldn't keep doing it. There's an entire beach down there if you want to throw things. Bob, my Bigfoot best friend and fellow bartender, put his giant hand on my shoulder as he took the football from me. I've got this. Pour yourself a beer and go do some paperwork in the office. I felt bad because the first thing I felt when he said that was relief, but it had been nonstop for a week. In fact, Bob had cut his vacation short by two days to help. I didn't understand why we were suddenly attracting college kids when we'd always had more of an older, refined group. The why didn't really matter, though, because it was the reality that I had to deal with. Rather than fight fate, I gave the kid a final tight-lipped smile and turned on my heel to do as Bob said. Once I'd poured my beer and was settled comfortably in the office, I took a deep breath and an even deeper pull of the beer. I usually had enough patience for five people, but the extra chaos on top of the fact that I'd been bartending, co-managing the bar, and filling in for Blake, the resort administrator, when he needed to be away, was taking its toll on me. I hadn't seen a 40-hour week in over a year. Mine tended to run 60 to 80, and I was running out of gas. I opened the desk drawer and pulled out a couple of manila folders full of job applications. It had been over a year since the manager of the Tiki had met his demise at the hands of a witch out for revenge, but we had yet to find anybody suitable to take on his job. Of course, he hadn't been suitable for the job either, but that was neither here nor there. Ari, 
the Angel of Water, and one of the founders of the Enchanted Coast, had given Bob and me a significant raise to co-manage the bar, but it was proving to be too much. We were both exhausted, and Bob was losing too much of his family time to keep it up. When he'd cut his vacation short to come back, that had been the last straw for me. It was time to find a dedicated manager, but that was proving easier said than done. I flipped through the most recent applications, and for once, one of them caught my eye. I ran my finger over the tiny print of the application and reminded myself for the hundredth time to reformat them so that they were big enough to read. The woman was 34 years old, had 15 years of experience in the restaurant industry, and had managed three bars in that time. Two of the three places had been high-end, and one of them had been for magicals only. That was a good sign. It meant she was used to dealing with some of the crap that we had to put up with on a regular basis. Experience managing a human bar was great, but you also had to be able to deal with cranky witches, snarky werewolves, and mermaids who had too much to drink. That added an extra layer to the job that most people can't appreciate until they've done it. I set the application aside to review with Bob later, since he had a decent eye for reading between the lines. I'd just opened the second folder when some sort of chaos erupted out on the patio. It was so loud that even with the door closed, I could hear some of what people were saying. With a sigh, I slammed the rest of my beer and trudged toward the door, dreading whatever fresh hell I was going to have to deal with now. I made it to the bar just in time to see Bob vault over it and rush toward a group of werewolves who were throwing punches at each other. I rolled my eyes and reached for my last few drops of patience before I headed in that direction, too. They'd overturned two tables, and several cups that had held sticky drinks a few seconds before were scattered across the brick pavers. Pineapple wedges and a few maraschino cherries that had been garnishes were strewn about, and the people who'd been sitting at those tables had retreated to watch from a safe distance. One woman, a young witch who'd stayed with us before, had a large pink stain on the front of her white bathing suit wrap. Knock it off! I barked as I approached. This is a family resort, not some frat house spring break place that you rented in a college town. I snatched one werewolf by his hair and put a little bit of magical oomph in it when I yanked him off the guy he was beating on. When I released him, there was hair tangled in my fingers, and I didn't even feel sorry. He slapped his hand to the back of his head and scowled at me. Dude, what's your problem? We're just having a little fun. Dude, I replied through gritted teeth, giving him a look that would have melted plastic. For one, I'm not your dude. For another, you just brought trouble to my tiki bar. That doesn't work for me. And if you say so much as another word, throw another football, or step one toe even close to the line, I'll ban you from here for the rest of your visit. Bob had already separated the other three who'd been fighting. That was one of the benefits of working with a Bigfoot who has hands the size of baseball mitts. You can't do that, one of the other guys said, outraged. He combed his hand through his $300 haircut and smirked at me. We paid good money to be here just like everybody else did. His buddies cheered him on. I shrugged and met his gaze dead on, letting him know in werewolf speak that I wasn't cowing to him. I don't care what you paid for. You're dealing with the two people who have complete and total say over this entire area, and if we say you're bounced, you're bounced. Now, want to start over with a little more respect in that tone? He glared at me but didn't say anything else. Instead, he motioned to the three guys he'd been fighting with, who now appeared to be his best buddies. Let's go to the casino. This is lame anyway, and the drinks are watered down. He spun on his heel to make his grand exit and ran smack into one of the hottest women Odin had ever created, literally. Stephanie, a Valkyrie who spent a lot of time here, stood with her legs braced and her hands on her curved hips. She looked like a swimsuit model in a gold bikini that shone against her tan skin and highlighted her fit figure. But if you looked carefully, she had the eyes of a predator. 
one look into her chocolate depths, and any person with a dram of common sense would have known they were treading dangerous waters. This guy lacked that dram. Well, hello, gorgeous, he said, pulling off a swagger even as he steadied himself. What say you let me take you to the casino? I'll let you blow on my dice for luck. Now, normally, I would have corrected the guy and pointed out his mistake before he regretted it. Today wasn't a normal day, though, and I wasn't feeling generous. I crossed my arms and stepped back to watch the show, unable to suppress the evil grin tugging at the corners of my mouth. Stephanie arched a perfect brow, then kissed her fingertips, held up her palm, and puckered her lips like she was going to blow it at him. While he practically drooled in anticipation, her other hand snaked out and grabbed him by the front of his tank top and jerked him so close to her that they were nearly nose to nose. I have a better idea, she purred, raw power pouring off her. From the fear in his eyes, I'd say the guy had realized his mistake even if it was a minute too late. Why don't you apologize to all these nice people you disturbed, and to Destiny and Bob, tip them a hundred bucks for putting up with you, then take your little playgroup down to the beach so the adults can enjoy their vacations? He attempted to shrug her off and regain face, but she held tight and didn't break eye contact. What are you? he asked. A deadly smile slipped across her lips as she took a sip from the umbrella drink she'd casually picked up with her free hand. Me? I'm your biggest nightmare. She shrugged. I could have been your best friend, but that ship sailed without you already. Now run along. She gave him a little shove as she released his shirt, and he stumbled backward to catch his balance. All that college education must have paid off because he didn't utter another word or even raise his eyes from the ground as he motioned to his friends toward the beach. Uh-uh, Stephanie said, wagging her finger. I think you're forgetting a couple steps. He grumbled and shot her a glare that wouldn't have been out of place on a five-year-old's face but shoved his hand in his pocket and pulled out a money clip. I'm sorry. Slipping a C-note off the outside, he threw it toward me, then turned and stomped off. I grinned as the bill fluttered to the ground, but Stephanie narrowed her eyes. Do you want me to make him pick it up and hand it to you nicely? She asked, tilting her head. I gladly will. That pup needs a lesson in manners. Nah, I replied, feeling lighter than I had all day as I watched him stomp away. Though the other guys followed him, they kept glancing over their shoulders at Stephanie in confusion. I doubt they'd ever seen their buddy taken down by a woman. That was good enough. I appreciate it. With them gone, the tiki area returned to its normal calm vibe, and I breathed in and out a few times to get back in the right frame of mind. I loved my job but today was one of the few times when I'd forgotten why. It was nice to be reminded. Chapter Two Once the party crowd had left for the beach, it didn't take Bob and me long to get the tiki area cleaned up. Since I'd opened that morning, Bob told me to go ahead and take the rest of the afternoon and evening off. Dimitri, the evening bartender was due to be there soon, and there really wasn't any need for the two of us to stay on until he got there. It took me a couple hours to do the shift paperwork, and by then I'd calmed down and got my equilibrium back. Rather than head straight back to my place when I was finished like Tempest wanted to do, I decided to go for a walk on the beach. The sky was a brilliant blue, and though it was hot, a nice breeze was blowing. I closed my eyes and pulled in a deep breath, letting the grandness of the view smooth my remaining ruffled feathers. I was a water witch, which meant being close to the ocean brought me closer to myself and kept me centered. It also fed my magic. I was a little disappointed in how I'd reacted that morning. I didn't usually get rattled like that. 
But in my defense, the resort had been nonstop for months, which meant I'd been working a ton of hours, even though Bob and I were splitting the managerial duties. My thoughts drifted back to the application I'd found earlier, and I vowed to give her a call. The college guys must have found something better to do because the beach was abandoned. I spread my towel in the sand and took a seat, pulling my knees to my chest and wrapping my arms around them to stare out over the water. I'd just gotten comfortable when the water began to churn a hundred yards or so offshore. Before I could process what was happening, a long, tall structure rocketed through the air from the water and landed just a few yards from where I was sitting. It struck the sand with a thud that shook the ground, and I jumped to my feet, my heart racing a mile a minute. After I'd determined that whatever was laying on the beach wasn't going to get me, I spared a look to make sure there weren't any more incoming missiles. A giant blue tentacle waved to me from the water, and I pulled in a deep breath. A kraken I'd dubbed Bart periodically chucked cans, sunken rowboats, and other garbage from the ocean. I wasn't sure whether he thought he was being helpful or if he was just sick of seeing human crap in his water, but he'd never thrown an entire small building ashore. I glanced at him, then at the red and white striped lighthouse, and something snapped. I flung my hands in the air and snatched up my towel and purse. I'd finally hit my breaking point. That's it. I'm done. Without another glance at the lighthouse or the kraken, I snapped my fingers and teleported back to my cottage. I was going on vacation before I lost my mind. Tempest, who'd already gone home, glared at me as I popped in and threw my towel across the back of the couch. What's got your knickers all twisted? I ran my tongue over my teeth as I stomped into the kitchen to get a glass of tea. Ah, uh, let's see. My idyllic workplace is being turned into a setting from Animal House, I haven't had two days off in a row in months, and a kraken just threw a lighthouse at me while I was sitting on the beach trying to get my head straight. Is it really too much to ask for just a few minutes of peace? Before I even made it through my tirade, the weight of responsibility started to drag me down. I couldn't just leave a lighthouse lying on the beach, no matter how much I just wanted to walk away from it all. I sighed and said as much. I have to go deal with it. Don't be a dork, she said, running her fluffy white tail between her paws. You can, and you will just leave it there. Call Blake, tell him what happened, and then tell him it's not your problem and you're going on vacation. Because that's exactly what you're going to do. Fighting the pull to do it myself, I did as she said and slipped my phone out of my pocket to do as she asked. He picked up on the first ring, and I didn't even get the first sentence out of my mouth before he cut me off. Slow down, Destiny. Believe it or not, I do have a finger on the pulse of this entire resort. I knew about the lighthouse 15 seconds after it happened, but by the time I got there, you were already gone. Don't worry about it. It's not a big deal, and I'm taking care of it. Blake was the administrator for a reason, and I had no idea why I felt such a responsibility to take on everything myself. I guess it was because my brain was so scrambled, because he'd been gone several times on business, and during those times, I'd covered for him. It was hard to turn it on and off. Of course you are. If you need me, call me. He laughed. I'm not calling you. I heard about your morning. Relax. I'm glad you said that, Tempest called loud enough for him to hear. We're going on vacation. I think that's a fabulous idea, he replied. Call Colin or Mila and tell them you'll be ready to go in half an hour. There's no need for you to stay here and worry about this, and it's high past time you took some time off. You have a month of vacation time stacked up for Pete's sake. The minute he said that, an immense relief washed over me. You know what? I'm going to do just that. I'll see you in a week. No, I'll see you in two weeks, he replied, and I could hear voices in the background. You haven't taken a vacation in almost two years, and it's not good for your head to work all the time and never take a break. 
Go hang out with Myla. Go see your folks. Or go somewhere with Colin. But get off this resort. And don't come back until you've taken at least half your time. I didn't know about being gone that long, but I did want to take a week. I didn't feel right leaving Bob alone at the bar, even though he did have Dimitri and Elena to back him up. A week was a start, though. I wished him luck with the lighthouse and hung up. Before I could change my mind, I pulled my phone from my back pocket, scrolled through my recent contacts until I found Myla and stabbed my screen to make the call. Hey, I said when she picked up. What are you doing? Hey, yourself, she replied, and I could tell she was glad to hear from me. I was just leaving my neighbor's place. I'm watering her plants and feeding her cat while she's away on vacation. A little stab of disappointment shot through me. If she was tied to town like that, she wasn't going to be able to get away with me. I loved Abaddon's Gate, but I didn't feel like spending my entire vacation there. Oh, how long do you have to do that? When will she be back in town? Only one more day. She went up to visit her sister in Panama City Beach. She'll be back sometime tomorrow afternoon. Why? That made me feel much better. What you doing afterwards? I have to get out of this place, and I figured you might want to go with me. She paused for a second before she answered. Are you serious? You haven't taken a vacation from that place in two years. I was beginning to think you were just going to chain yourself to that tiki bar and never leave. Not that she was one to talk. She had a little potion store, and most of the time you couldn't drag her away from it. We both needed a break, and I was going to convince her to take one with me. I'm dead serious, I replied. I've reached the end of my rope, and my knot is frayed. If I don't get out of here soon, I'll end up cursing somebody or losing my mind. Wow, what happened to push you that far? Usually you take everything right in stride. I sighed. It's not just one thing. You know I've been wearing three hats for the past year, and it's just caught up to me. I had a bunch of werewolves get in a fight this morning on the patio, and they were being rowdy before that. Then I'm sitting on the beach to relax, and some goofy kraken throws a lighthouse at me. Well, to be fair, he wasn't throwing it at me. He was just tossing it ashore. Still, when you hit the point when something like that doesn't feel weird to you, it's time to take a vacation. Tempest, who'd been pacing with me as I talked, popped up on the back of the couch. Put her on speaker. I did as she asked. And Blake told her to get out of here for two weeks instead of one. I'm going to hold her to it, and I'm going to drag you and Calamity with us. You need a break, too. Maybe we can go see Cory and Chaos. I miss them. So what do you say? I asked. Again, she hesitated. Well... It has been a long time since we got away. This is the slow season. It's not like I'm going to miss a lot of business. All my regulars are stocked up. So I don't see any reason why I can't take at least a week off. Where do you want to go? I hadn't even thought about that part until Tempest had mentioned Cory and Chaos, who was Tempest and Calamity's sisters. Mila was an earth witch, so she was more comfortable where there weren't a lot of structures and buildings and concrete. I felt the same. We'd been raised in a small town, so a big city wasn't really our game, regardless of our powers. I don't know. What do you think? We could go home, or we could go see Cory, like Tempest said. Cory was my cousin, and she was a sheriff in a little place called Castle's Bluff up in Georgia. It was a neat little town, but she was as bad about taking a vacation as we were. Maybe we can convince her to come with us. She needs a getaway, too, so just going up to visit Castle's Bluff won't help her any. Corey's not going anywhere. She just got back from spending a week up at Mom's, so I doubt we'll be able to convince her to take off again. That was a bummer, because I hadn't gotten to spend much time with Corey in a longer time than I was comfortable with. The three of us had been raised like sisters, and it was hard living so far away from her. I did teleport up for the night occasionally, but that wasn't exactly quality time. Myla broke into my thoughts. 
I do need to go up there and scope the place out a little bit. I'm considering opening up a second shop there. Sean Castle's opening up a resort just for paranormals. Well, not really a resort per se, though I get the feeling it's going to be a bit beyond the spa he'd originally planned. It's going to have a little shopping area in it, and I'd like to scope it out to see if he thinks a potion shop will be a good fit. I'll call her then. Maybe she can take a bit of time anyway. I'm sure Sam could hold down the fort for a few days. Sam was her second in command, and he was more than capable of being sheriff himself, except he said it would cut into his fishing time. My head was starting to spin with possibilities as I paced and talked. I'd never been one to sit and have a phone conversation, and now that I was thinking about getting away, I was pumped full of energy. Okay, Mila said. You do that, and I'll make arrangements for my stuff here. Do you want to come over here tonight? I thought about that for a second. If I was going to be away for more than just a night or two, I need to pack and take care of stuff like clearing my fridge, not that there was much in it. Nah, I'll stay here tonight and wrap things up, then come over tomorrow around noonish. There are a few things I need to buy before we leave. Though there were stores everywhere, Abaddon's Gate was a magical city. If we were going on vacation, I wanted fresh waterproof mascara and some magical curl spray for my hair. Anything non-magical just wasn't enough to hold it. Good deal. Talk to Corey and decide what we're doing. I'm up for anything now that you've drawn me in. Ooh, I'm happier than a pig in mud right now. She resisted adding a little squeal, but it was there in her voice, and it made me smile. Though she was the one more prone to that sort of response, I was right there with her for once. I was going to get to spend time with two of my favorite people in the world, and I couldn't wait. Chapter 3 I puttered around for the next few hours taking care of little details like cleaning my house, doing laundry, and packing. By around six o'clock, my stomach was growling, so I headed to the kitchen. It'd been a minute since I'd gone to the grocery store, so all I really had left was cereal, unless I wanted to dive into the pantry and actually cook. I pick up the box and give it a shake, and realized there was only about half a bowl left. At that point, I sort of wanted to shake Colin because he was the only one who left a handful in the box. I would have filled my bowl to the rim and called it a day rather than leaving less than a serving in the box. Looks like we're going out to eat, I said, tossing the box into the trash. I'm actually okay with that, Tempest said, hopping onto a kitchen chair. I'm pretty sure we don't have anything good to cook tonight anyway, so why don't we head up to Mario's and get some pasta? You know what? That sounds amazing. Mario's was the Am Resort high-end Italian restaurant, and it had the most luscious chicken served with a lemon butter sauce and goat cheese. My mouth watered just thinking about it. The best thing about most of the places on the resort was that they didn't have the same dress codes that restaurants of equal caliber would have in the regular world. I wasn't about to go there in cutoffs in a tank top, even though I could have. We encouraged comfort over formality, and that extended to every corner of the resort, including the restaurants and casino. The only requirement most places had was that your clothing couldn't be wet. That was just a courtesy to other guests. Since I was on vacation now, I decided to spiff it up a little bit. I picked through my closet and pulled out a yellow sundress and a pair of strappy white sandals. Then I went to the bathroom and actually applied makeup instead of just dashing on some mascara and lip gloss like I usually did. Fancy, Tempest said as she paced while I got ready. Now can we go? I have meatballs waiting for me with my name on them. Tempest had friends in every kitchen on the resort, and she had them all wrapped around her paw. Even though I'd warned her not to go bumming food, she always ignored me and did it anyway. She knew more about the menus than I did. All right, already. Let's go. My stomach rumbled as if it agreed with her. Let's teleport, she said, running a lap around me. 
I'm starving, and it's hot. I don't want to walk all the way up there. I thought about that for a second, and though I was tempted, I opted to take the route that would burn the most calories. No, we're going to walk. I plan on tearing up his lemon butter and goat cheese chicken, and I'll probably end with some tiramisu, so the exercise will do me good. We'll probably end up having to teleport back because I doubt I'll be able to walk that far. Mario's always put me in a food coma because no matter how much I protested, he always insisted on sending us out free calamari to start with and then a big wedge of tiramisu to end our dining experience. Though my mind said no, my stomach slapped it down, told it to shut up, and said yes. She sniffed and put her nose in the air, her fluffy tail waving like a flag. Fine, have it your way, but I'm riding on your shoulder. I'm not walking. I scoffed, like I expected anything different. Tempest tended to have a lot of cat-like qualities, and disliking exercise was one of them. Between her sheer laziness and her love of food, it was a wonder she wasn't so big around that she was incapable of walking. Of course, with my appetite for fries and burgers, I didn't have much room to talk. I took my time, for once enjoying the fact that I didn't have anywhere to be. As we walked, I ran my hands over the top of the seagrass and enjoyed the sound of the waves rolling gently to shore. The sun setting over the Gulf of Mexico turned the sky gorgeous shades of purple, pink, and orange, and I sighed, content just to be where I was at. Margot, the sphinx who stood guard outside the main resort entrance, shifted her large head and smiled as I approached. Destiny! she exclaimed. It's amazing to see you. I've heard you've had a bit of a tough time down at the tiki, and I've been worried about you. I smiled, genuinely glad to see my friend. She and I had spent many an evening watching the sunset, gossiping about the goings-on at the resort, and just enjoying each other's company in general. Since I'd been working so much, I hadn't had as much time to spend with her as I would have liked, so I stopped for a few minutes to chat. My stomach could wait. Tempests, on the other hand, wasn't eager to pause. If you're going to stand here and flap your jaws, I'm going to go ahead in and get us a table. What she really meant was that she was going to go in and beg for her spaghetti and meatballs. Rarely did socialization come before food in her mind, especially when it came to anything from Mario's. I waved a hand toward the bank of doors leading into the resort. Go ahead. I'm going to stay out here and catch up with Margot for a little bit, and then I'll be in. Do you want me to order you anything? She asked, already moving toward the entrance. I shook my head. Nah, I'll order when I get in there, because I don't want it to get cold. She lifted a fuzzy shoulder. Okay, then. Don't take too long. Bye, Margo. I'll stop and chit-chat on my way out. Right now, I'm starving. Destiny's been cleaning for the last three hours and didn't give me so much as a single treat. Margo's lips curved into a small smile as she twisted her head to look at Tempest. A little bit of dust rattled down onto her platform as she did so. I look forward to it. Enjoy your meatballs and tell Suzanne I said hello. Suzanne was one of the new servers, and she and Margo had gotten close. I was glad my friend had found someone to talk to because I knew she got lonely. It didn't help that a lot of people didn't realize she was a sentient being. Most just thought she was a giant statue put there for their viewing pleasure. Little did they know, she was one of the resort's best security measures. In that light, I suppose it was a good thing that most people didn't know about her, but that didn't make me feel any better for her personally. I climbed onto her pedestal and sat between her paws, assuming my regular position. So what's new with you? Not a whole lot. Same stuff, different day. It is a little disconcerting, picking up on all the mischievous intent these college kids have. That was Margot's skill. She could see into the hearts of our guests and determine what their intent at the resort was. 
If it was ill, she used her judgment to determine whether or not she should call Blake, and in some instances, she intervened immediately. I pulled in a deep breath and released it as I gazed out at the sunset. She had the best view on the entire resort. I know exactly what you mean. Things have been crazy, and not in a good way. I worry that our guests who come here for rest and relaxation are going to find a new place to go. Everything seems to be chaotic all the time down there, and it's about to drive me nuts. In fact, I'm going on vacation tomorrow. Myla and I are going to go up and see Corey. That's amazing, Destiny, she said, and I could hear the genuine pleasure in her voice. I'm a little surprised Blake convinced you to go, given all the excitement today. I huffed. All the excitement today was actually what pushed me over the edge and convinced me he was right that I needed to take some time. Between the brawl on the patio and the kraken tossing a lighthouse at me on the beach, I've had it up to here. I made a motion over the top of my head to let her know I was full up and then some. Oh, she said, her voice a little uncertain. I know all that has been stressful, but that's not what I was talking about. I was referring to the body they found out in the mangroves. I sucked in a breath and twisted around so that I was staring up at her. Body? What body? I've been at my cottage all afternoon cleaning, and I didn't hear anything about a body. She paused, and I could tell she was weighing her next words. Maybe I wasn't supposed to tell you that. As a matter of fact, pretend I didn't. Go on in, eat your dinner, then go home and get some rest before your vacation starts. It was just a simple drowning, and though it was tragic, I'm sure Blake can handle it without you. It's not like it was a murder, and even if it were, this resort can run just fine without you for a couple of weeks no matter what. You take too much onto yourself. I scowled and huffed out a frustrated breath, irritated that nobody had let me know about such an important event. I knew Blake was determined to get me to leave and would have never let me know, but I was surprised Bob or Dimitri hadn't contacted me as soon as it happened. There wasn't anything that went on at the resort that we didn't know. Of course, I suppose in the scheme of things, I shouldn't have been shocked that they kept me in the dark. Bob was just as determined as everybody else to get me off the resort for a while. Still, though horrible, if it was just a drowning and nothing nefarious, Margot was right. There wasn't anything I could do about it, so I was going to push it from my mind and let Blake handle it. With my mind made up, I chatted with Margot for a few more minutes, then went in to have my dinner. Despite my determination to push the drowning to the back of my mind, the restaurant was abuzz with people gossiping about it. That was to be expected, though. The Enchanted Coast was a small town in its own right. It didn't take news long to travel, and just like everywhere else, it often got distorted along the way. The factors that all the whispered conversations seemed to have in common were that the guy was a middle-aged wizard and he'd gone out in a small john boat that morning to go fishing. Tempest glared at me, her eyes narrowed as she plowed her way through her second serving of meatballs. You better only be eavesdropping as a curious outsider, she said. If you're thinking about stepping in, get it out of your head right now. We're going on vacation, and I don't care if it turns out that guy was attacked by a bunch of sea monsters from the deep. Starting this afternoon, it ceased to be our circus, and it's definitely not our monkey. She was right. Besides that, I hadn't heard so much as a whisper about it being anything other than a tragic drowning. I finished my dinner, and as expected, Mario sent out a slice of tiramisu big enough to feed three lumberjacks. Rather than trust myself to stop eating it before I blew up, I asked my server for a box and separated out all but a small slice for later. It would make an excellent midnight snack while I was binge-watching whatever new series happened to catch my eye. Rather than go straight home when we finished eating, 
I decided to stop by the Tiki and have an after-dinner cocktail with Dimitri. Tempest wasn't happy with me, but I figured I wouldn't be seeing him for at least a week and wanted to say goodbye. When I got to the Tiki, I was happy to see that there were several people there, but they were all older guests. Everybody seemed to be having a good time, but the jukebox was playing at a low level in the background, and people were chatting and relaxed rather than rowdy. I'd already determined that if the place had more of a nightclub feel, I'd just skip the drink and go straight home. I was glad that wasn't the case. Hey, Dimitri! I took a seat on my favorite stool and hooked my feet through the rungs to pull it closer to the bar. It looks like you're having a good night. Has it been this peaceful all evening? Dimitri, a fairy with a flair for being colorful, was currently rocking electric blue hair and wearing a hot pink tank top and matching board shorts. We didn't have the same dress code at the Tiki that other staff people on the resort did, mostly because we wanted our guests to feel casual and relaxed, and it was too hot to be walking around in a black polo and black slacks. Hey, Des. He replied, smiling, as he slid a coaster in front of me. Are you doing beer or a cocktail? A cocktail, I replied. I just came from Mario's, and I'm so stuffed that there's no way I can hold a beer. I'll do a rum runner. Only one, though. I'm heading out to Mila's tomorrow, and I don't want to be hung over. He cocked his head at me. You mean to tell me that you're actually walking away from a murder? Not that I'm not elated that you're doing it, but I am a little shocked. At that, I whipped my head toward him, my heart beating triple time. What do you mean, murder? I heard it was a drowning. He chewed his lip and looked like he'd been caught with his hand in the cookie jar as he popped an orange wedge and a cherry in my drink and slid it across the bar to me. Then that's what you should keep thinking. Forget about it. And enjoy your vacation. I dropped my head to the bar and clunked my forehead against the smooth wood. Blake had every tool at his disposal that he needed to deal with even that, and though it was hard, I was gonna walk away. Or at least, that's what I told myself. Chapter 4 I sipped on my drink and tried not to focus on what Dimitri had told me. My curiosity got the better of me, though. When Dimitri finished pouring drinks for a group of Gorgons, I motioned him back over to me. I couldn't help but notice that he'd gone out of his way to give me a wide berth since he'd spilled the beans to me. He leaned his elbow on the bar and raised a winged blue brow at me. I already know what you're going to ask, and I wish you wouldn't. I ignored his wish. Why did they think he was murdered? I'd heard it was a simple drowning. What changed? I fiddled with my coaster, peeling apart the cardboard layers in an attempt to appear casual. Dimitri shook his head. Just leave it alone, Des. It doesn't matter anyway. Blake already has a suspect. It's going to be open and shut because the dead guy was seen arguing with some dude in the casino yesterday. The guy has no alibi. Security is investigating but it looks to be pretty obvious. The suspect even had a ring belonging to the dead guy on him. He reached across the bar and squeezed my hand. Let. It. Go. Thinking about it, I probably shouldn't have even said anything to you. Blake will skin me if he finds out I'm the one who ran my mouth. I pressed my lips together and gave him a tired smile. As far as I can tell, I have no skin in the game. It's open and shut, like you said, so I'm just asking questions out of sheer morbid curiosity. For the most part, that was true, too. I'd helped investigate several murders, but there had been extenuating circumstances each time. I'd either been the one to find the body, or someone close to me had been involved. Though the situation sucked, it had nothing to do with me. We chatted for a bit before he had to go serve up some more drinks. As I'd vowed to myself, I cashed out after I finished my one drink and headed back to my cottage. Before I'd talked to Dimitri, I'd considered walking home to help my huge meal settle. Now I'd lost my taste for a casual stroll, so I snapped my fingers and teleported back. 
Tempest was already curled up on the couch when I got there, and she peeped an eye open when I appeared in the living room. Where have you been? We finished eating like an hour ago. I checked all the locks in the house and made sure all of my outside wards were set before shoving the tiramisu in the fridge and pouring myself a glass of iced tea. I stopped by the tiki to have a drink before I came home. She sat up and narrowed her eyes at me as she wrapped her tail around her paws. And what else did you do? Something is definitely up. Don't you dare tell me that Dimitri or Lena need you to work for them because that's not going to happen. I shook my head as I settled on the couch beside her. Nope. As a matter of fact, Dimitri is all for me going on vacation. He and Bob have already worked out a schedule, so all my shifts are covered. She studied me for a minute without saying anything. Then why does something feel off with you? I shrugged and flipped on the TV with the remote. I don't know what you're talking about. There's nothing off with me. I flipped through the channels until I found a show about haunted castles. I really wanted to go to Europe, and unlike most normal people, I wanted to check out all the creepy things. I was having a hard time getting my mind to settle, though. So, I said halfway through the episode, it turns out that guy didn't drown. He was murdered. Oh, for crying out loud, Tempest exclaimed, jumping up from where she'd been lying beside me. She scowled. Don't you even think about it. We're going on vacation, and that's that. I haven't seen chaos in months, and you need to spend time with Corey, too. Before you know it, she and Alex are going to be married, and it won't be just the three of you anymore. Calm down. I said, my tone soft. She didn't do well with change, and she missed her sister terribly. I was just passing on the local gossip. I didn't say I was planning to do anything about it. She sniffed. Yeah, but I know you. You're going to end up sticking your nose where it doesn't belong, even though it doesn't need to be there. Nope, I'm not. Rather than argue with her, I turned the volume up on the TV and stared straight ahead at it. The episode was about the Tower of London, and it was the first stop on my list of castles I planned to visit. I squinted, trying to see if I could catch any shadows of ghosts in the footage, even though the logical side of me knew that most of the ghosts had enough common sense to hide from the cameras. I was more interested in whether or not you could do independent tours without a guide because I wanted to get a chance to bend a ghostly ear or two and get a real lesson in history. If I had to stick with the tour group, I'd draw more than just a few odd glances if I started talking to thin air out of the blue. I know you have these big plans to go interviewing ghosts, Tempest said once the segment on Lady Jane Grey was over. But what happens if they end up being murderous or something? After all, you haven't really talked to anybody about this. And when I say anybody, I mean ghosts you can trust. I know there are real psychics out there, but we don't know any of them. And I'm not willing to take the word of some carnival hack that we're not going to go over there and get turned inside out or something. I grinned at her. Where's your sense of adventure? She arched a furry brow at me. My sense of adventure ends at eating chicken that set out overnight. I have no desire to be ripped apart by some nut job ghost with a mood on. I gave her a little shove. Don't be a baby. It'll be fun. You'll see. By that point, I was so wrapped up in making a mental list of the castles I wanted to visit that I'd pretty much forgotten about the murder. My phone rang and I dug into the couch cushions to find it. At some point, it had slipped between the cracks and gotten away from me. After the third ring, I finally fished it out, worried I was going to miss the call. I smiled when I saw that it was Colin and slid my finger across the screen to answer. Hey, handsome, I said. How was your day? Hey, beautiful. My day was so-so. I spent most of it working on websites for some of the pack's new business interests. I'm a little annoyed because I could have done that from there. 
I did go over some preliminary paperwork for a couple businesses the PAC is considering taking over, and I also toured three properties that the PAC is considering buying, so I guess it wasn't a total waste of time. Colin was the PAC attorney, but he also filled in and did other things as needed. Usually, he could do most of his work from wherever he was at, but sometimes he had to go to court or do other things such as checking out new properties that required him to be there in person. I didn't even pretend to understand PAC politics, so I usually just supported him in whatever he needed to do without asking a lot of questions. I assume you're still not going to be able to make it down this weekend? I asked. No, he replied, his voice thick with regret. The Alpha is inducting some new members into the pack, and he wants me to be here for the celebration. I also need to sign some contracts with them because they own some businesses. That was another weird thing about PACs. Even though everybody was free to own their own businesses, they were expected to contribute something to the PAC coffers. I wasn't a fan of people having to pay money just to exist in peace, but I also understood that it was a tradition that all the PAC members accepted and gladly participated in. There were a lot of benefits, including protection, free legal services, and access to all of the PAC's substantial power, so I guess in some ways it made sense. So how was your day? He asked. Honestly, I replied, not so fabulous. I had to deal with a rowdy pack of werewolf post-grads throwing nerf balls around the tiki and acting the fools in general for most of the day. Then I had to break them up when they were fighting. Then I went down to relax on the beach and a kraken threw a lighthouse at me. He laughed. I'm almost afraid to ask about that last one. Do you mean like a real lighthouse? Yep. I said, popping the pea. That's exactly what I mean. It was just a little one, but it was still enough to rattle me. After all, it's not exactly like that's something you would expect to come at you when you're sitting in the sand minding your own business. Your life is truly bizarre sometimes, he said in amazement. I seriously don't know how you deal with all of that without losing your mind. I went to the kitchen to refill my tea and grab the tiramisu, then prop my phone between my cheek and shoulder as I headed back to the couch. To tell you the truth, I'm holding on to my sanity by a thread. I decided today that I'm going to take a vacation, and Blake told me to take at least two weeks. I agreed to a week, but now I'm rethinking it. Two weeks sounds delightful, or at least it will if you'll be able to take some time off with me. He whistled. Do I need to call and see if hell froze over? You're seriously debating taking a full two weeks away from work? Yes, Tempest called loud enough for him to hear. She's not just debating it, she's going to do it. We're going up to see Corey to hang out for a bit. I don't know what we'll do after that, but whatever it is, we'll be far away from here. She gave me a satisfied smirk because she knew she had a co-conspirator in Colin. I returned her smirk. She's exactly right. How do you feel about going to Europe and touring some of those castles like we talked about? She drew her brows down at me. That wasn't exactly what I had in mind. I grinned. I know, but it's what I want to do. You're just going to have to suck it up and put on your big girl pants because we're going to do some ghost hunting. That is, assuming Colin is down. One of the many benefits of working at the Enchanted Coast was that there were portals to almost anywhere. Though I had the magic to teleport all three of us easily enough, I had to have been there in order to do it. If I hadn't seen the place, I couldn't get us there, plus it wouldn't be wise to just teleport us to some public spot where we could be seen by non-magicals. However, all we had to do was step into the portal with the intention of where we wanted to go in our minds, and that's where we'd land. It was a brilliant bit of magic that had taken several different paranormals to pull off. I'd used the portals to get to Abaddon's Gate many times, but I'd never ventured further than the States. I figured now was as good a time as any. That sounds amazing, he said, enthusiasm lacing his tone. I can probably leave here Sunday. That would give us a week and a half to do whatever we want. 
I assume things have slowed down there then? I bit my lip before I answered him. He tended to worry about me, even though there really wasn't any cause for him to, so I didn't really want to tell him about the murder, especially considering it seemed Blake had it wrapped up. Still, if I didn't tell him, Blake would. In fact, I was surprised he didn't already know about it since he was the attorney of record for the resort. He was the only one, though, so I had to assume that Blake had contacted one of the others in an attempt to keep it from me. I don't know if it's exactly accurate to say it's calmed down, I said, picking at one of the tassels on my afghan. They found a body out in the mangroves this morning. At first, they thought it was a drowning, but apparently it was a murder. Before he could say anything, I rushed to reassure that I had no intention of getting involved. Don't worry, though. I'm not touching the situation with a ten-foot pole. Come tomorrow morning, I'm off like a prom dress. Mila can't leave till tomorrow afternoon because she's watering her neighbor's plants and taking care of her cat while she's on vacation, but there are a few things I need to pack up at Abaddon's gate before I go. I'm planning on getting up and heading straight out so that I can have breakfast at the diner. I might even text Michael to see if he's available. I haven't hung out with him in a couple of weeks, and it would be nice to catch up. That would be awesome, Tempest said, hopping off the couch and doing a little lap around the end table in her excitement. Text him as soon as you hang up. I smiled at her exuberance. She had a semi-crush on Michael's wolf familiar, Rocky. Colin went quiet for a second, and I checked to make sure he hadn't hung up. I'm really proud of you, Des and I can't wait to go watch you talk to zany ghosts. I smiled, excitement coursing through me just thinking about all the fun we were going to have. It's going to be a blast. I'm going to get off here and start making plans so we can get as much in as possible. Love you. Once we disconnected, I turned back to the TV and hit play. Twenty minutes later, my internal warnings went off. Somebody was trying to breach my wards. Since I had them set to let Blake, Dimitri, or Bob and his family cross, it worried me a little bit. It was nearly midnight, and I had no idea why anybody would be coming to see me that late. Rather than let them down for some random stranger, I put another one in place, one that would allow me to see through the shield but would prevent them from seeing in. I slid into my flip-flops and unlocked my door, magic ready at my fingertips. What are you doing? Tempest asked sleepily, picking her head up off the couch. Somebody activated my wards. I'm going to go out and see who it is. I pulled the door open, but before I could step out, she scurried around in front of me and puffed herself up. Are you out of your mind? You have no idea who it might be. You can't just go running out there in the middle of the night. I raised my brows at her. Obviously, she'd been watching too many ghost stories. I'm sure it's probably just somebody that's gotten lost and wandered away from the resort. It wasn't common for that to happen, but it wasn't completely out of the norm, either. She glared at me. Fine, but if you get attacked by some demonic shadow figure, don't expect me to jump in and try to save you. I rolled my eyes. Noted. Since my house was invisible through the new shield, I flipped on my porch light and tromped across my yard. Of all the people I expected to see, Amber and Dax, my people friends and regulars at the Tiki, were at the bottom of the list. However, there they stood. Worry and fear were obvious on Amber's pretty face, and Dax's jaw was set in the hard line. Though they were perfectly capable of swapping their fins for human legs, they weren't huge fans of doing it, and I couldn't imagine what had driven them to do it in the middle of the night. I waved my hand and muttered a few words to release my ward on that side of the house. Amber, Dax, what are you two doing here? Are the kids okay? Did something happen? Amber jumped as I suddenly became visible to her when my ward dropped. She rushed forward and pulled me into a hug. The kids are fine, but we've got a problem. Dax's brother has just been arrested for murder, and Blake isn't listening to reason. You've got to help us. I sighed. So much for vacation.
Chapter 5 Come on inside, I said, motioning toward the house. There's no need for us to stand out here in the dark when we have a perfectly good house with a fresh pitcher of tea or wine. Your choice. From the looks of things, I think that's what I'm going with. They followed me inside, and I offered them something to drink. While I poured them tea and poured myself a glass of wine, they took a seat at my small wooden kitchen table. I'm really sorry to drag you into this, Dex said, but I don't know who else to turn to. I handed them their drinks, then joined them at the table. Tempest hopped up on the fourth chair and glanced at them expectantly. It's probably best if you start at the beginning. Why do they think Jackson killed someone? I assume he's the brother you're referring to? Dex came from a large family, but the only one who came to the resort on a semi-regular basis was Jackson, his youngest brother. Amber sighed. Because they got into an argument at the casino. You know how Jackson likes to gamble, and he's a bit of a hothead. This isn't the first time he's gotten into trouble over poker, but it's the first time he's ever been accused of murdering somebody over it. I took a drink of my wine. What were they arguing about? It must have been something big if they think he was willing to kill the guy over it. Dax scoffed. Money, of course. What else? My brother happens to have more than his fair share of luck at the tables, and people tend to get annoyed when he wins, especially when they're losing a lot of money to him. I raised a brow. When you say he has more than his fair share of luck... Do you mean he counts cards? I only knew Jackson from the tiki and didn't keep track of what went on at the casino unless it was something big. I had a hard time keeping up with the monkeys in my own circus. No, Amber said, shaking her head. That's just it. He really is just that lucky. Did you ever just meet somebody who always happened to be somewhere at the right time? Or you know that one guy who always wins when it comes time to draw straws? Jackson's that guy. We all joke that before any big event, we should rub his head for luck. I probably would have been skeptical about that had it been anybody but Amber telling it. As it was, I believed her. Not only did I know she would never lie to me, I also knew she was no fool. If Jackson was a cheat, she would have picked up on it no matter how good he was. Okay, so when was this? I heard it was yesterday. Is that correct? Yeah, Dex said, taking a drink of his tea. I'm not understanding what the fight was about, Tempest said, rubbing her cheek. Was the guy accusing Jackson of cheating? Amber lined my placement up so that it was following the edge of one of the boards on the table. Sort of, but from what we understand, the guy was more irritated because he was on a steady losing streak. From what everybody says, he was being unreasonable, and Jackson was just the person he decided to take it out on. I'd seen a lot of people get like that at the casino, so I knew what she was talking about. I also knew that people who had the money to blow didn't typically react like that when they lost. It sounds to me like the guy was spending money he didn't have. Was that the case? Dex raised a shoulder. I can't speak to that. All I know about the guy is that he's dead. My brother got into an argument with him the day before he got that way, and now they think Jackson's the one that did it. He was shifting his weight back and forth as if he couldn't get comfortable. I didn't know if that was because he wasn't used to being out of the water, or if it was the situation he found himself in, Either way, I wanted to make him feel better. I heard the suspect, I'm assuming Jackson, had a ring that belonged to the victim. Is that right? It is, Amber said, raising her gaze to mine. The guy ran out of money, so he bet a ruby ring. When he lost it, that's when he got angry. Now I was starting to understand. Did anybody else see Jackson make the deal with him to take the ring in lieu of cash? Dax sighed. Not that we've been able to find. Jackson said that's what the fight was over. The guy accused him of cheating and refused to give him the ring after Jackson beat him. Rather than make an even bigger scene, Jackson just let it go. 
It wasn't that big of a deal to him. Was it a signet ring? I asked. Surely the guy hadn't bartered his wedding band. No, he said, shaking his head. It was a big ruby one. Mer people had a different take on what was valuable than most other species did. To them, money wasn't worth much. They placed more value on things that were pretty. For instance, a well-crafted silver spoon would be more valuable to them than a suitcase full of cash. Most of them had very little contact with the human world, so cash wasn't king to them. Amongst themselves, they lived on a barter system. Tempest grabbed a peach from the bowl in the center of the table. So how did Jackson end up with the ring then? She took a big bite of the peach, and juice ran down her chin and coated her whiskers. Jackson said the guy hunted him down later, Amber replied. Apparently, the guy had cooled down and realized he'd been a jerk. He found Jackson in the bar and gave him the ring an hour or so later. I licked my lips, thinking. That should be easy enough to prove. There are cameras all over the bar area. That's just it. Dax replied, shaking his glass so that the ice cubes rattled in it. The camera does show the guy talking to Jackson, but the bar was so crowded that you can't really see more than just their heads. Also, the music was loud, so the guy was kind of yelling. In that situation, it's hard to tell from his expression if he was mad or just trying to be heard. Still, that proves they talked, I said. That should be at least enough for Blake to give him the benefit of the doubt. You'd think, Amber said. But I guess it was ugly enough in the casino that a little bit of muddy footage of them speaking to each other an hour later at the bar isn't enough to clear him. Tears welled in her big brown eyes. All I know is that Jackson didn't do this. Yeah, he's a hothead. And... Yeah, he did argue with the guy, but I promise you, he didn't kill him. Can you help us prove it? I sighed. I was supposed to leave on vacation tomorrow. I felt guilty even saying that when I saw their stricken expressions. But I suppose it won't hurt to stick around an extra day or two and help you clear your brother's name. After all, solving murders was kind of my thing, it wasn't like I could start my vacation until the next evening anyway. I glanced at Tempest, who had her paw on her forehead. I reached out to her through our link. What do you think? She glanced at me and rolled her eyes. What do you think I think? I think we're going to have to help them whether we want to or not. And that was why we worked so well as a team. I smiled at Amber and Dax, hoping it came across as reassuring. I'll start checking into it first thing in the morning. You have my word that I'll do everything I can to clear his name. Once they left, I pulled my phone from my pocket and tapped out a text to Mila to let her know that I had to put our trip on hold. L-O-L, she texted back. I didn't even bother to tell anybody I was going to be closed yet. I figured I'd believe you were coming when I saw it. That made me feel kind of bad and I texted her a sad face. Don't sweat it, she replied. I have a couple things I need to do anyway, so solve your murder as soon as you can, and I'll be ready to go when you are. I reset the wards around my house, thinking how lucky I was to have such a great family. I sighed. Now I just had one more call to make, and I wasn't sure Colin was going to be as understanding as Mila was. He'd been so excited that I was taking time off that I hated to crush his excitement. He wasn't a big fan of me going up against a murderer when he wasn't there, and really, who could blame him? Maybe it would be best if I just helped Blake put the murder to bed without saying anything. After all, it wasn't like I was in any real danger. After Amber and Dax left, I did everything I could to sit down and relax, since I figured it would be the last night I was going to get to myself, at least until I solved the murder. I had to wonder why Blake was being so close-minded about things, but I did understand that he had a lot of pressure coming down on him from above. After all, even though we were a place strictly for supernaturals, which inherently brought more risk for violence, murder was never a good look in a vacation destination's reviews.
rather than trying to force my brain to shut down, which was an exercise in futility anyway, I decided to Google the victim. As it turned out, Marty Keller was a kept man. His wife, Sandra, came from a long line of money, and there was lots of info about them in the society pages. I had to wonder about how Sandra's family felt about her marrying down like that, since everything I could find on Marty prior to their marriage would have fit into a thimble with some space left over. What I found about him after they hooked up, however, indicated he'd embraced the lifestyle of the rich and famous with open arms. Pictures of them cruising on fancy yachts, eating at high-end dinner clubs, and hosting charity events at one of their several mansions were splashed all over the society pages of both paranormal and human celebrity rags. There were also plenty of pages showing him fishing on private charters with friends, gambling in casinos around the world, and participating in just about any other spending manly man activity that you could think of. Basically, if it involved spending a ton of money on stupid things, he was involved in it. He also seemed to have a thing for jewelry. In every pick, he was wearing gold necklaces and at least two or three rings. Looking closer, the only one that never changed was a large signet ring on his left ring finger. His wedding band, maybe? What I didn't see were a lot of pictures of them together outside of the society events. That made me wonder if they were just two people who enjoyed their privacy, or if the marriage wasn't as peachy keen as they wanted to let on. That was food for thought, because when you added up the facts that he was spending her money and that they were rarely seen together, it could have potentially resulted in an unhappy wife with the means to put a permanent end to her marriage without having to pay alimony or lose half her stuff. Though there was likely a prenup involved, there would probably still be a significant payout in it for him if they split. I made a note to check into that because a simple spousal murder would be open and shut and would get me on my way a lot faster than if it was something complicated. I pumped the brakes on that a little bit, because the last thing I wanted to do was the same thing that Blake was apparently doing. I wanted to find the murderer, not a scapegoat. You know, you're not going to find an article that says, Hey, look at Marty. All kinds of people wanted to kill him, and here's the list. Tempest said after a couple hours of watching me scroll through a million pages on the internet. I rubbed the back of my neck. I do realize that, but maybe I'll at least find a thread to pick at? Maybe, she said yawning, but don't hold your breath. If we've learned anything about rich people, it's that you can't tell anything much about them just by scrolling through all the fancy schmancy events they attend. She was right. But given the fact that my brain wouldn't settle, and I couldn't concentrate on anything on television, I didn't have much else to do. And I'd much rather go into the situation with a little bit of knowledge than walk in blind. My eyes were starting to feel like they were full of sand, and I was surprised when I checked my phone and it said it was 3 a.m. Tempest had long fallen asleep on the couch, and the TV that had been left on in the background had gone to screensaver. I pulled in a deep breath and stretched my muscles. I'd been sitting in the same position for so long that I'd pretty much frozen in place. I arched my back and rolled my neck, wishing I hadn't drunk a gallon of iced tea while I was looking. Fortunately, the caffeine didn't affect me like it did most people because I drank it in such mass quantities. The only regret I really had was that I was going to have to get up 15 times in the middle of the night to get rid of it. That meant I'd probably head into the next morning bleary-eyed, and that wasn't the way to start a murder investigation. It was hard enough to pick up on fine details and nuances in a person's speech when you were wide awake, let alone when you could barely hold your eyes open. Still, some sleep was better than no sleep, so I hit the sack. Surprisingly, I was out almost before my head hit the pillow. Chapter 6 
My dreams that night were a crazy mix of flying lighthouses, lines of customers clamoring for drinks while I frantically searched for the ingredients I needed to make them, and a guy who looked strangely like Dax being hauled away in chains while I stood helplessly by. A dream interpreter would have a blast with my life if they took ten minutes to crawl inside my psyche. Of course, anybody crazy enough to crawl into my gourd would need years of therapy themselves, so that was an avenue I wasn't willing to pursue just out of common courtesy. It didn't take me long to get ready the next morning, but I spent the time organizing my thoughts. I was almost positive I hadn't met the victim or his wife, so I figured meeting her was the first order of business. Well, after talking to Blake, that is. He wasn't going to be happy that I had postponed my vacation, but that street went both ways. I wasn't thrilled that he was forcing my hand by not listening to Amber and Dax, but I was hoping to change that. I was going to do my best to convince him that he needed to look more closely at other suspects so I could pack my bags and head out, knowing he was giving it all he had before letting the council ride roughshod over him. It wasn't like he was unreasonable or stupid, so if I just presented him with an alternate suspect, I had faith that he would take it seriously. I needed to make sure that whatever I took him was strong, because I had a feeling if he'd already arrested this guy, he had a lot stronger evidence than just having the two of them on tape arguing. Blake wasn't the type to rush ahead on something like that with so little evidence, especially when a man's future and life hung in the balance. Tempest spent the morning sulking, alternating between glaring at me and staying completely away from me. She was displeased, to say the least, that I had opted to take the case. She'd get over it, though, because deep down, she was one of the fairest, most compassionate beings I'd ever met. Finding evidence of another suspect would help me smooth her ruffled feathers, too, so it was even more important. So you know Blake wouldn't have this guy under arrest if he wasn't sure he did it, right? She'd hopped up on the bathroom counter while I was washing my face and brushing my teeth and had spent five minutes just staring at me. She knew it irritated the crap out of me, so I suspect that was her motivation. I fished a new tube of Myla's special moisturizer with sunscreen from my closet and slathered it on my face. Yeah, but you also know Amber and Dax. Do you really think they would have come to me if they weren't convinced that his brother was innocent? I swiped on some mascara, but didn't get any fancier than that. It was about 200 degrees above boiling outside, so any other makeup would have just melted off my face anyway. Tempest lifted a furry shoulder. I don't know. We do funny things when it comes to family. After all, what if it was Myla or Corey or Michael that was in trouble? I shot her a, don't be stupid, look. You know as well as I do, none of the three of them would ever kill anybody. So, of course, if they were accused, I jumped to their defense. This is apples and oranges. She tilted her head at me and just stared for a few seconds so I could think it out. I realized what she was trying to make me see. Michael was a member of the Paranormal Criminal Bureau of Investigations and often came up against shady people. It wasn't out of the realm of possibility that he might kill somebody in the line of action, and it could be interpreted as something other than self-defense. I pressed my lips together, not wanting to admit that she was right, even though she was. That might be a different circumstance, but it was still a situation where he could be accused of murder and even arrested for it if the right people were running the investigation. Anything was possible when you lived in shades of gray like he did. Fine, I huffed. Point taken, but we still have an obligation to Amber and Dax to at least check it out. I'm not saying we shouldn't check it out, she said. I'm just saying that we might need to be prepared for the fact that we might be tilting at a windmill. It's entirely possible that the guy's guilty. You know how it is when money comes into these things. For that matter, based on all the pictures and articles that we saw about the guy last night, I can see where he might be the sort of person to inspire murder. 
I slipped some lip gloss on and headed to my closet to find something adult-like to wear. As a beach bartender, my business casual was shorts and a tank top, but if I was going to talk to somebody in a semi-official capacity, I needed to look like I had a right to ask questions. If every annoying person on the planet were able to push a rational person to murder, we'd have a whole lot more killings on our hands. She shrugged a furry shoulder and hopped onto my bed. Do you really think so? I mean, we already have a ton of them. People murder each other every day, especially in the supernatural world. She huffed a breath out through her nose and combed her paws through her tail, smoothing it down. Shoot, for that matter, I'd say there are at least as many people knocking each other off in the human world as in the supernatural one. And I'm willing to bet a lot of them are driven to it. She ran her paws through her fluffy tail, tugging a couple tangles out of her black and white fur. People are annoying. Even I could be pushed to murder under the right circumstances, and so could you for that matter. She wasn't wrong, but I figured we should at least give Jackson the benefit of the doubt until we talked to him and to the victim's family. I slipped into an olive blouse with a keyhole neckline and my slate cargo capris and called it good enough. It was hot, and I hadn't slept well. On top of that, I'd only had enough coffee to make one cup, and that wasn't nearly enough to get me started. Rather than trudge through the heat, I decided to teleport to the tiki. This was sort of breaking my own rule, because I was the only person on the resort besides Blake that had that privilege. Plus, I ate way too much fried food and needed to walk all that off. However, I considered being out of coffee and having to find a murderer extenuating circumstances. Even though the tiki wasn't open yet, I aimed to land by the dumpster behind it so I wouldn't land on some poor soul on their way to the beach. Surprisingly, Bob was already there and almost tripped over me because he was carrying a stack of boxes so tall that even he couldn't see over them. When I saw them teetering, I shot out a little jolt of magic to stabilize them for him. Des, he exclaimed, his eyes narrowing in suspicion. What are you doing up here this early? I thought you were starting your vacation last night. I slid the top box off his pile and tossed it into the dumpster. Yeah, I know. I was. But Amber and Dex stopped by my house last night. Apparently... Dax's brother has been arrested for murdering that guy yesterday. Bob tossed the rest of the boxes into the dumpster and brushed his hands off. Let me guess. They say he's innocent, and you plan to prove it. Yes, and yes, I said, following him back around the corner of the tiki toward the patio. I headed straight to the coffee maker and made myself a coconut mocha coffee. What else am I supposed to do? They say Blake thinks he has him dead to rights, but they swear he didn't do it. He rolled his eyes and shook his head. You don't say. The suspect's brother swears he's innocent? That's certainly new in the history of murders. He washed out the sinks and filled them with soap and sanitizer while I finished making my coffee. I went around the bar and pulled out the fruit, the cutting board, and the knife, slid them onto the bar, then walked back around and pulled myself up onto a stool in front of them. Ha ha, the brother isn't just anybody. He's Dax. You know I have to help if I can. I sliced an orange in half as he shot me a wry look. No need to get snarky, he replied as he stacked beer glasses in the freezer. You just have to realize how it looks. I understand that Dax is one of the most grounded people I've ever met. I'd even go so far as to say that if he thought his brother did it, he wouldn't have come to you. However, I also know that family is inherently biased. Nobody wants to believe somebody they know and love has it in them to kill someone. He moved around the bar and shooed me away, then took my seat in front of the fruit. As far as I'm concerned, you're still on vacation. That means you're not doing any work around here, 
and you're going to find out who killed that dude as fast as you can. Then, as soon as you do, you're hightailing it out of here. And don't think for a minute your vacation starts a second before you step foot off this property. You're not going to blow your personal time solving resort problems. Tempest, who'd been quiet since we'd gotten here, snatched an orange wedge and waved it at me. He's right. You're not robbing me of time with my sisters just so you can help somebody else, even if it is Dax and Amber. As far as I'm concerned, you have until this afternoon when Myla's neighbor gets back to solve this thing. I rolled my eyes. That's fresh. You know as well as I do, it probably won't happen that fast. Secretly, though, I was right there with her. Nothing would make me happier than to lock it down and bail by nightfall. I plucked my cup of coffee from the bar and motioned to her. Then without further ado, let's get this show on the road. Chapter 7 I knew Blake wasn't going to be happy about my decision, but I figured it was better to face him right off the bat. I can't say I was looking forward to it, though, so rather than teleport as far as Margo, which was as close as I could go, I decided to walk and gather my thoughts. Tempest, on the other hand, told me I was on my own and disappeared with a flick of her whiskers. Even though it was barely nine in the morning, it was already wicked hot. My blouse was sticking to the small of my back, and my hair was already damp around my collar. Good morning, Destiny, Margo said, her stone face curving into a smile. So, what are your plans for the first day of your vacation? I sighed and gave her a half smile. Well, if it ever gets here, Myla and I are going up to see my cousin for a little bit. Margot drew her brows down. What do you mean, if it ever gets here? I mean that even though my vacation's supposed to start today, I had to postpone it. Amber and Dax came to see me last night, and it's Dax's brother that's been accused of the murder. Understanding crossed her face. Ah, now I see. But why did you agree to help them? Why not just go to Blake and tell him he's got the wrong person? That's why I'm here right now, I said, putting my hand over my eyes like a visor to keep the sun out when I looked up at her. I know Dax and Amber swear he's innocent, but I can't believe Blake is ready to lock him up and throw away the key unless he has solid foolproof evidence. I figured I'd go up and talk to him and see what he has. That is, if he'll actually share it with me. Then you better get to it, she said, pulling in a deep breath and releasing it. I overheard them last night saying he was going before the witches' council today. A thought occurred to me. Wait, did they bring him past here last night when they arrested him? She nodded. As a matter of fact, they did. And if you're asking what I think you're asking... I didn't sense anything other than fear from him. Maybe a little bit of anger, but that definitely wasn't the prevailing emotion. I thought about that for a second. Since it had been several hours since the murder, it was possible Jackson could have no longer been feeling murderous. After all, once you kill somebody, you probably wouldn't feel bloodlust anymore. At least not if it was a one-and-done thing. That didn't mean, though, that maybe he hadn't passed by Marco when he was feeling that way. Did Jackson come by you at any point day before yesterday? I asked. She furrowed her brow, and a little bit of sand trickled down from her. As a matter of fact, he did. I spoke with him a few times. Since he's a regular, we know each other, and I rather like him. He spends time with me when he's taking a break from the tables. And since he's very old as well, we swap stories of how things used to be. Hope fluttered in my chest. Please tell me you talked to him shortly after he got in a fight with Marty. She tilted her head a little bit. I'm sorry, who's Marty? Oh, 
I said, waving an impatient hand. I'm sorry, Marty's the guy who got killed. In case you didn't know, Jackson got in a fight with him day before yesterday in the casino. Apparently, Marty was running short on cash and was sore because Jackson kept beating him. Understanding crossed her features. Oh, yeah, a lot of people have that reaction to him. He does have the best luck, and it's hard for some people to believe he has that without cheating. He did mention it had happened again, but it didn't seem to matter much to him. He's laid back and takes that kind of thing in stride. Not much rattles him, and I don't think I've ever seen him mad, unless he's talking about landwalkers tossing garbage off boats. That's a real sore point for him, because his pet sea turtle Freddy got caught in those plastic rings that they used to put soda cans together. He almost died, and that's turning into a common occurrence. I couldn't really hold a grudge there, because that was an irritation to me, too. I never understood why people couldn't just throw their stuff in a garbage can instead of flinging it over the boat. I chewed my lip for a second, thinking. You didn't sense any ill will from him that day? She shook her head. No. Actually, he was in quite a good mood, not a drip of ill will. In fact, if you gave me a list of 50 people we both know and asked me to put them in order of who I think would be prone to kill somebody, he'd be pretty close to the bottom of the list. He's seriously an old-school, peace-and-love kind of guy. Thanks, Margo, I said, feeling a little better about sticking my nose into the investigation. Now I was ready to get inside and out of the heat. You've been a lot of help. Good luck, Destiny. For what it's worth, I don't think he did it. I realized I'd forgotten the most important question of all. Or at least the second most important question. I turned back to her. Has there been anybody else to go through here that seemed that angry? She shook her head. No, but I wish there had been. That would make things so much easier, wouldn't it? I sighed. It sure would. But things are rarely that easy, are they? Once inside the main resort, I was surprised to find Tempest waiting by the bank of elevators for me. She was pacing and glancing toward the door, and once she saw me, she scowled. Where on earth have you been? There's no way it took you that long just to walk from the tiki to here. Unruffle your tail feathers, I said, returning her scowl. I stopped to talk to Margo, and I actually learned a couple of things. I stabbed the button to call the elevator, then rubbed the goosebumps the AC had raised on my damp arms. She butted my leg with her head. Well, are you going to tell me, or do I have to guess? The elevator door slid open, and I stepped aside to let a family of vampires off. Once inside, I poked the button that would take us to Blake's office. In a nutshell, she knows Jackson and doesn't think he could ever murder anybody. Apparently, he's a lover, not a fighter. But she didn't have anybody else pass by her that felt off either. Well, she said as the door slid shut, that does make me feel better. Even aside from her magic, Margot is an excellent judge of character. If she says she doesn't think he did it, then I tend to believe her. Not that I don't believe Amber and Dax, but you know. Yeah, me too. Before we could discuss it further, the door slid open and Blake himself stood there facing us. He pulled in a deep breath and released it when he saw us. Let me guess. Somebody blabbed and told you about the murder, and you're here to help me solve it. Apparently, you didn't hear the part about how I've already got the guy who did it. Actually, I heard you have the wrong guy, I replied, crossing my arms and arching a brow at him. But I also know that you wouldn't have arrested him if you didn't have solid evidence. So, tell me what you've got, and if you convince me you have the right guy... I'll consider just walking right back out that door and going on my vacation right now. He rubbed the back of his neck in a way that let me know he was getting irritated. 
How about the fact that I have a witness that saw him get on the boat with Marty yesterday morning? My heart sank. I'd asked for solid evidence, and an eyewitness definitely fit that bill. I wasn't even sure if I was going to be able to figure this one out in time. How dependable is the witness? I asked. If it was just somebody who'd started his morning with a couple Bloody Marys for breakfast, I could knock some holes into that in a heartbeat. Dependable enough that I have no choice but to believe it, he said, his jaw clenching. He reached out and jabbed the button for the first floor. I leaned my hip against the brass rail that ran the circumference of the wall and studied him. I had a feeling he was backed in a corner, but had no idea how. Blake was very much his own man. What do you mean you had no choice but to believe it? You always have an option. Besides, that's a non-answer and a weird way to put it. Do you think he did it, or don't you? His gaze slid to me, and he glanced up at the camera in the upper corner of the elevator. He flicked his wrist, and a little prickle of magic trickled through the elevator. At the same time, the box lurched and came to a stop. I wasn't sure what was going on, but he obviously didn't want people to monitor what he had to say. He turned to me, his expression dead serious. Urgency rolled off of him. I'm not sure who blabbed to you, but I'm glad they did. I was just on my way to your place, and I was dreading being the one to put your vacation on hold. What I mean when I say I have no choice is that the Keller family donates a lot of money to various council activities, and it was the widow's brother who supposedly witnessed Jackson on the boat with Marty. But you don't believe him? Tempest asked, hopping up on my shoulder. He shook his head. Something's off. I don't know what, but the guy was just a little bit too smooth with his story. Off how? I asked. Blake raked a hand through his hair, and from the way it was standing up, that hadn't been the first time he'd done it today. I don't know, just off. While he was telling me the story, he looked me straight in the eye, and his gaze never wavered. Usually when people are reliving a string of events, their gaze shifts as they think about it. I rolled my eyes. Not that I don't want what you're saying to be true, but that's a pretty thin reason not to believe the guy. What aren't you telling me? He sighed, then shifted his weight from one foot to the other. Little lines creased his eyes, and if I hadn't known better, I'd have sworn he looked a little guilty. Let's just say there was a substantial donation to the resort this morning. The founders are delighted, and they're lapping up the council's narrative. Even if that means convicting an innocent man? I shook my head, unable to believe the utter lack of humanity these people often showed. He drew his brows down in frustration. You know as well as I do that half of our board are creatures who don't really care about the goings-on of the day-to-day -day world. Most of the relationships are transactional, and that's what bugs me. Unlike them, I want to know why the donation was made, and I want to know who made it. Wait, Tempest said, shifting toward him. Her claws dug into my shoulder a little bit as she did, and I winced. You don't even know who made the donation? You have to know where every single penny donated to the resort comes from, even when it's anonymous. Blake ran a hand over his face. You're right. This is the first time I haven't had access to that information, and I don't like it. That's a discussion I'm going to be having with the founders eventually, because right now, the board is all over me. For now, though, we need to find out who really killed Marty Keller and put this to bed. They can't make me convict an innocent man if I have the real killer dead to rights. That's why I was coming to you. His brown eyes went soft. I'm really sorry, Des. I swore to myself I wasn't going to let you get dragged into this, but I can only do so much in my official capacity. I don't know who's gagging me, but you can bet your bottom dollar I'm going to find out, and when I do, somebody's going to pay. That's not how I work. Nobody's going to force me into doing anything that I don't want to do. I let that roll around in my brain for a minute, trying to look at it from different angles. 
I agreed wholeheartedly that he needed to find out who was trying to game the system, but I also knew that he needed to stay on the inside if we were going to be able to control the narrative. Don't apologize. You're not making me do anything I wasn't already planning on doing anyway. So let's just get past that. What else can you tell me about the murder? And was there anything on the security cameras that backs up Jackson's claim that Marty gave him the ring in exchange for the money owed him? It occurred to me that I wasn't even sure how the guide died, and I didn't even know how long he'd been on the resort. The latter I could find out for myself, but the former was, for once, a mystery, because only Blake's security team had likely had contact with the body. There's not much to say about the murder itself. He was underwater, so there's no chance of getting any fingerprints or anything like that. But I can tell you that he was strangled. As far as security footage showing Jackson getting the ring from Marty, there's nothing. His gaze shifted to the floor. I can't prove it, but I think our security feeds were tampered with. What? I snapped my head toward him. That's not possible. That system was designed by the top minds in the entire magical world. It's tamper-proof. Tempest huffed a breath out through her nose. There's no such thing as something that's tamper-proof, Destiny. You know as well as I do that there's a way around everything, no matter how powerful the magic, if you know what you're doing. I sighed, knowing she was right, but angry that someone had corrupted the enchanted coast. This place wasn't just my work, it was my home, and many of our guests were also my friends. Our security wasn't just one of our biggest selling points, it was a source of pride. People here were safe, whether we were talking about their physical bodies, their money and personal belongings, or their privacy. We took great pride in the fact that our guests were here for an experience where they could just relax and have fun without worrying about anything. Anger swept through me. Even on a normal day, there was nothing I liked better than knocking someone off their high horse. Now they'd mess with my home and the people I cared about, and I was going to make sure they regretted that to their dying breath. Chapter 8 A second after Blake turned the camera back on and restarted the elevator... The floor indicator stopped on the first floor. You're going to have to go about this a little differently than you usually do, he said. If I'm going to be able to stay on the inside, I can't help you. I can't arrange for you to talk to anybody, and I can't be seen giving you any more information. Not that I have any more to hand over anyway. His jaw flexed, and I knew this was burning as bacon. If there was anybody who took more pride in our resort than I did... It was Blake. He'd been with it from the beginning, and just like for me, it was way more than a job for him. There's not really anything else I can tell you that you can't find in the hotel records anyway, he said. The council shut me down hard as soon as Xavier, that's Sandra's brother, came forward and said he saw Jackson get in the boat with Marty. What do you mean they shut you down? Tempest asked, maintaining her position on my shoulder as we stepped out into the expanse of the grand foyer. Blake scratched the stubble on his chin and shook his head in frustration. I mean that within 15 minutes of the donation hitting, Xavier came forward, told me what he saw, and then the council called me five minutes later. There was zero delay between any of the events, so I have no doubt they were related. I don't know why they're trying to shut this down, but I can guarantee you, Xavier is part of it. This was one of the ugliest parts of the supernatural world. Most of the controlling governments and higher organizations were run by people who'd lost their touch with humanity. Everything came down to dollars and cents and power. People on the individual level didn't exist unless they had their checkbook out. Fortunately, that antipathy had an advantage. They didn't bother to butt into the daily goings-on of most of our lives. As long as things stayed at status quo on their end, they didn't care what the rest of us did. I reached out and took his hand and gave it a quick squeeze. You manage things as best as you can on your end, 
and I'll take care of the rest. If you can buy me some time with the council, that would be amazing. Have you been able to get in touch with Ari? Tempest asked. Ari, or Ara Riel, was the angel of water and was one of the most human non-humans I'd ever met. He also truly cared about what went on at the resort and with all the people on it, guests and staff alike. Blake shook his head as he stepped closer to me to avoid colliding with a pair of fairy kids rushing toward the front doors in their bathing suits. No, I've been trying his cell. I've emailed him, and I've even tried to hit him up on Facebook. Of course, all those only work if he's actually on Earth, so if he's in Celestial City, he won't get anything until he gets back down here. We have a founders meeting in a couple days, but I don't think we have that long. I agreed with him. I also know that when he finally did get here, he was going to be pissed when he found out what the council had pulled. He was protective of the Enchanted Coast and had made it clear that we existed under our own laws. That was necessary, considering we dealt with large gatherings of different species of people every day. Each pack, clan, coven, pride, and the million other names for groups and families all had their own rules and laws. There was no way we could enforce all of them separately, so we had our own resort rules and laws for small crimes, and people signed waivers when they signed into the resort. The exception to that was for murder, and our policy there was to find who did it and turn that person over to the presiding authority of the victim. That was standard in the magical world, and it had worked for us so far. Ari prided himself on our rules and policies and wasn't going to take kindly to the council stepping in. Our governing agency was intimidating to a lot of witches, but Ari was an angel. He had zero cares and could smite people and do all sorts of other awesome, terrifying, angely stuff. And to be honest, in this situation, I'd bring a bowl of popcorn and watch him do it. You keep trying to get a hold of him then, We could really use the backup, but I don't think we can count on it. I'm going to go talk to Sandra Keller. Got any idea where I can find her? Check the spa. Last time I spoke with her, she was having quite the fit of vapors. He rolled his eyes when he said that, which led me to believe he wasn't buying her story any more than he was choking down the whole witness situation. I started to ask him about it, but before I could, a squat middle-aged man in a pinstripe four-piece suit, complete with a pocket watch chain, hustled toward us. I've been looking all over the place for you, Blake, he said, his skinny handlebar mustache twitching. I had to bite the inside of my lip to keep from snickering, because he was only about twenty pounds and a top hat away from looking exactly like Snidely Whiplash. Blake squished his face together in a manner that I think was supposed to be a smile, but looked more like he was constipated. I've been in my office, Lester. If you wanted to find me, that's where you had to look. You could have messaged me as well. What can I do for you? Lester's beady gaze flickered to me. I swear, it was like somebody looked up the definition of evil cartoon antagonist when they created him. We're ready to transport the prisoner. We checked the standard rooms that you use to hold people, but they're occupied by guests. Blake gave him a tight smile. Yes, Lester, they are. This is a resort, and we're right in the middle of busy season. Had you bothered to check with me, I would have told you that we have him under arrest in one of our empty one-bedroom employee cottages. Blake shot a frantic look at me when Lester glanced toward the elevators at a Bigfoot family goofing off and laughing. From the look on his face, he had an allergy to fun. Don't you think you're being a little hasty? I asked him. The murder just happened yesterday. That hardly seems like enough time to conduct a thorough investigation. Lester didn't seem to care for my opinion. Rather than respond, He stared down his long, skinny nose at me. And you are? Before I could answer, Blake introduced me. This is Destiny Maganetti. She's a bartender and co-manager of our tiki bar. She was just checking in with me to let me know she was leaving for her vacation. 
so that's how he wanted to play it. I was heading out of town. Nothing to see here. Lester tilted his head and narrowed his eyes at me. Meg and Nettie, huh? I've heard of you. Stay out of my investigation. I cocked my hips and raised my brow at him, stopping short of crossing my arms. Funny, you've heard of me, but I have no idea who you are. Care to enlighten me? Blake shot me a look that would have fried the hair off a skunk, but he should have known better than to believe I would respond any differently to being high-hatted. I'm Lester Graff, he said, drawing himself up as if that should mean something to me. And don't think I haven't heard about your shenanigans. I mean it. Stay out of my way or else. I don't need your amateur sleuthing messing up my investigation. Tempest dug her claws into me in warning, and I held my tongue. Mostly. Ah, yeah, your investigation. I wouldn't want to stop you from pursuing every lead. His face puckered in irritation. Obviously, he was a big fish in a little pond who expected all the little people to just fall at his feet. That told me he was probably with the council. In my experience, most of them felt that way. With that in mind, I gave him my best version of a professional smile and nodded. Well, it was very nice to meet you, Lester. I have a vacation to get to, so if you'll excuse me, I want to get right on that. Tempest jumped down, leaned into my leg, and bumped me toward the door. I glanced toward Blake, then appraised Lester. I had a general idea of what Blake wanted me to do, but I wanted to make sure. I could only think of one reason why he would have been so detailed when he told Lester where he was keeping the prisoner. He wanted me to bust him out. That was a pretty bold move, though, so I wanted to make sure I had it right. Fortunately, Tempest and I had a mental connection, and so did she and Blake. I couldn't speak directly to him, but she could. Ask him if he means for us to do what I think he means for us to do. I thought to her. She glanced up at me and blinked her green eyes once. I'm pretty sure that's what he meant, but you're right. We better make sure. A second later, Blake looked at me and gave me an almost imperceptible nod. That was all I needed. All righty then, Lester, I said, giving him my brightest smile and brushing my hands off. You enjoy your railroading thingy and boiling puppies in tar or whatever it is you're doing after that, and I'm off to enjoy a tour of Europe's castles. He glared at me. The work I do for the council is very important, and I don't appreciate your mocking me. I go above and beyond so you can live the beach lifestyle and go globetrotting without a care in the world. Wow, delusions of grandeur much? I resisted the urge to mock him again. Considering I was about to bust out his murder suspect prisoner, I figured it'd probably be best to fly under the radar. I'm sure you're right, I said with nary a crossed eye or head wobble. It was a pleasure to meet you. Before he responded in a way that would make it impossible for me to remain nice, I turned on my heel and hustled toward the front door. As soon as I was outside, I leaned against Margo and huffed out a breath. Tempest jumped to the pedestal and then back up to my shoulder. Sand drifted down on my head as Margo looked down at me. I see you met Lester. Quite the self-important chap, isn't he? Tempest huffed out a little breath through her nose. If that man was any fuller of himself, that three-dollar suit would have busted at the seams. Marco laughed, but then turned serious. Did you discover anything that will help, Jackson? I shook my head. Not yet, but I did talk to Blake. He thinks enough money changed hands to hustle the investigation along. He doesn't like it, and neither do I. So we decided the best thing to do was for him to play along on the inside while I worked it from the outside. There's only one problem with that, though. Tempest said. Margot pressed her lips together for a second. Yes, and that's a very big problem. Members of the council want Lester to take him now, don't they? 
I nodded. Worry etched in her stone features. What are you going to do? You can't let them take him, Destiny. They'll put him to death. I saw this sort of thing happen so many times in history. It doesn't matter if you're guilty. It just matters who has enough money to convict you. You can't let that happen to him. I laid my hand on her paw. Don't worry. I'm not going to let them take him anywhere, at least not until I know for myself that he's guilty. Then what are you going to do? Simple, Tempest said, wrapping her tail around my neck. We're going to go bust him out. Then once he's somewhere safe, we're going to prove he didn't do it. Blake's keeping Lester occupied and buying us enough time to do it. Do you want me to chomp him the next time he goes past here? She asked, her expression hopeful. I grinned. What I want you to do and what you should do are two totally different things in this situation. You can help by keeping an eye out for anybody who has anything other than the sand, sun, and margaritas on the brain. If you learn anything before I talk to you again, let Blake know or catch Bob or Dimitri. They'll be able to get a hold of me. Will do, Destiny, and good luck. Jackson's a good guy. Since it was well known that resort security measures prevented anybody from being able to teleport, I was sure Blake hadn't revealed my exception to Lester. We only had one one-bedroom employee cottage open right then, and it was on the far end of the resort. I didn't have time to walk there, so I hustled down the path toward the tiki until I was out of sight of the resort and Lester's prying eyes. Then I snapped my fingers and headed off to commit my first ever jailbreak. Chapter 9 All the resort's one-bedroom cottages were identical, so I knew exactly how the one they were holding Jackson in was laid out. I decided that I'd just go straight for the gold, rather than trying to do any kind of recon outside first, but I wasn't completely dumb about it. I shopped for the coat closet in the living room. I figured that was the best place to sound things out without worrying about catching anybody naked or getting busted if there were guards inside. I got us in there with no problem, then stood inside the dark enclosed space and listened for a second. Somebody was shuffling around out there, and the TV was on. I twisted the doorknob, then eased the door open a couple of inches, hoping the hinges didn't squeak like mine did. All of the cottages came furnished, and sure enough, we had the right place. Jackson flopped down on the sofa and started flipping through channels. I pushed my magic out to see if there was anybody else in the cottage, and all I detected were two people outside the front door and two outside the back. I eased the door open a little further and poked my head out. Hey, I whisper shouted. Jackson? The poor guy bolted off the couch and spun toward me, his hands raised. Who are you? Magic radiated from him. I pushed the rest of the way out of the closet and held my hands out, trying to show him that I meant no harm. I'd only met him a couple times, and I didn't want him to blow me up, turn me into an armchair, or just strike me dead where I stood before he recognized me. Destiny Maganetti, from the Tiki Bar? I'm friends with Amber and Dax, remember? I'm here to help. His violet eyes flashed, and his face twisted in disgust, but he put his hands down. And how exactly do you mean to do that? There are guards at the front and rear, so it's not like we can just walk out of this place. I grinned at him. I guess it's lucky that I'm special then. I'm going to bust you out, and they won't even know you're gone. His gaze shot forward to the front door. Maybe you didn't hear me when I said there are guards at both doors? I was willing to overlook the snark in his voice. After all, the guy was locked up for murder, and if Margo and my friends were to be believed... He was innocent. I could hardly blame him for having an attitude. Tempest, on the other hand, wasn't willing to be so generous. And maybe you didn't hear her when she said she was special. Do you want our help or not? Somebody pounded on the door from outside. Who are you talking to in there? A deep voice rumbled as the doorknob jiggled. 
Shoot, I should have put a muffling spell on the door, but I hadn't thought to do that. I shoved my hand toward Jackson. Do you trust me or not? I think we're out of time, and no offense, but it doesn't look like you have a lot of options. He glanced at the door, then at my hand. I guess I don't have a choice. As soon as his palm hit mine, I wrapped my fingers around his and got us the heck out of Dodge. Chapter 10 I teleported us to one of the secluded beaches that only employees knew about, and his gaze shot straight to the water. To his credit, he didn't try to bolt, even though he could have probably shifted as he did and been gone for good. He was a merman. There was no way I could have caught him once he hit the water. Instead, he turned to me. What now? I bit my lip, thinking. He wasn't safe anywhere on the resort. There were all sorts of magical tracking security measures, and if we stood around for more than just a couple minutes, he was sure to be found. By now, the guard had already entered the cottage, so we probably only had two or three minutes tops before they sounded the alarm. Even if Blake was able to fumble around for a minute or two to buy us some time, he was way too good at his job for them to believe he couldn't find anyone anywhere on the property immediately. Call for Amber and Dax, Tempest said, clapping her paws to add some haste. He didn't hesitate, but rather closed his eyes in a way that I recognized. He was calling them with his mind. It didn't even take 30 seconds before the water churned and two large fish tails, one a sparkling turquoise and one a deep glittering burgundy, splashed several yards offshore. Rather than take the time to have them shift and dress, I rolled up my capris and waited out, motioning for Jackson to follow me. Tempest wrapped her tail around my neck, getting a grip so that she wouldn't fall in the water. Amber's gaze flashed from me to Jackson and back again. Destiny, what's going on? Based on where we're at, I have a feeling you're not here to tell us you cleared his name and he's free to go. I shook my head. I'm sorry, but I'm not. Something stinks with the council, and they're rushing forward to pin it on Jackson. Oddly enough, there was a big inflow of cash donated to the resort right before the witness turned up, and I need a minute to figure it all out. The council wanted to take him today, like right now, so I figured it might be wise to get him off the property while I figure out what's going on. Blake's holding them off as long as he can, but unless I miss my guess, we don't have more than another minute or two. I'm willing to turn him over into your custody as long as you promise to bring him back if I need you to. Jackson touched my arm. Wait, are you for real? You're just going to let me go? The disbelief on his features worried me a little bit. No, she's not just going to let you go, Amber said, glowering at him. She's releasing you into our custody until she can figure it out. I know you're a big dope, but I'm pretty sure there's nothing wrong with your hearing. Dax nodded at me, his expression serious. He dove under the water and popped back up a couple seconds later, holding a conch shell. He wiggled his fingers above it, and little flecks of gold and blue magic sprinkled down over it. Take this, he said, holding it out to me. If you need us, just blow into it. We'll hear you, and we'll be there within seconds. No matter what we're doing, we'll answer you. I looked down at the conch shell, which was smaller than the palm of my hand. Do I need to be near the water? Amber shook her head as they turned to dive into the water. Nope. Just blow into it, and we can come to wherever you're at. I gave myself a mental forehead slap when I realized that in my haste to get Jackson off the resort, I hadn't even questioned him. I stepped forward a little farther into the surf and cringed when a wave lapped against the bottom of my caprice. Another mark in the always wear shorts at the beach column. Wait, before you go, I need you to tell me everything you can about what you were doing yesterday morning. Were you at the casino, or anywhere else where we might have you on camera? They wouldn't be able to dispute security footage, assuming they hadn't tampered with that too. I had faith in Blake that he hadn't let that happen, and in Lester's arrogance that he'd overlooked the details. Jackson shook his head. I wasn't anywhere in the main resort. 
I had some stuff to do, so aside from playing a quick game of volleyball on the beach at around 8 with a bunch of werewolves early yesterday morning, I was underwater. The only reason I came back yesterday afternoon was because I was craving a cheeseburger. I figured I'd stop in for a quick bite and a drink before I headed out to take my nieces to see the baby turtles. They're all hatching right now in an area not far from the house, and the kids love to go look at them. I just sat down at the tiki and ordered lunch when security snagged me. I rubbed the back of my neck, thinking. He'd been playing volleyball before I'd gotten to the tiki, so I couldn't vouch for him. Were these werewolves by chance college age? Probably wicked hungover and using dude every other sentence? He nodded. That's them. Three of them thought because I was water folk that they'd be able to skunk me, but the other two with them had a little more faith and they could win with me on their team. They bet the other three a ridiculous amount of money and I was happy to help them beat the pants off their buddies. Hope filled my heart. All I had to do was track down the werewolves and get them to vouch for Jackson. So you have an alibi. Did you tell Blake that? I did, but by the time they caught me, the werewolves had all checked out. My heart sank. Though I could try to get in contact with them, I'd have to track down their names, and half the guests that came to the resort didn't leave cell phone numbers because it wasn't a required field. Still... If they were willing to swear that they'd seen him during the time when the murder was supposedly happening, Jackson would be free and clear. Okay, we're pushing our luck right now. Take off, and I'll do everything I can to clear you. I narrowed my eyes and wagged my finger at him. I'm going out on a limb for you, so don't hang me out to dry. If you do, Tempest said, her tone brooking no argument. I have plenty of friends who are water familiars. There won't be anywhere you can hide. I swear, I will not betray you. He didn't even bother to take his clothes off before he dove toward the water. Amber reached out and took my hand. You are a true friend. We won't let you down. Just as she released me, a little jolt of electricity ran over my skin. That was a sign that somebody was trying to breach the wards I had set on my cottage. I have to go. You guys get out of here, and don't show back up until I call for you. I promise you, I'll do everything I can to clear his name. I didn't wait for her to respond before I snapped my fingers and ported to my own bathroom. Somebody was about to bang my front door off the frame, so I grabbed my suitcase and flung it on the bed, then tossed a pile of clean t-shirts on the top of my dresser and into it so it looked like I was packing. I wasn't sure they'd come inside, but my contract with the resort waived the requirement of a warrant for resort security to do so with just cause. Hold your horses, I barked. I'm on my way. I rushed toward the front door, but Tempest, who jumped off my shoulder, grabbed my pants leg and pointed toward it. I glanced down and pulled in a deep breath when I saw that the bottoms of them were wet from when I'd been standing in the ocean. I muttered a quick drying spell, then strode the rest of the way toward the door. I jerked it open with an outraged glare. Blake and Lester were standing there with three guards. What do you want, Lester? I'm packing, and I know Blake wouldn't come banging on my door like this on his own. Lester squinted at me, suspicious. Where have you been? I rolled my eyes at him, mostly because that's what I would have done had I not just broken out his scapegoat. You mean in the ten minutes since the last time you saw me? I literally just walked in my front door. It takes that long to walk from there to here. He stretched his neck to peer around me and into my house. Who do you have in there? I crossed my arms and glared at him as I leaned my hip against the door frame. And what business is that of yours? I'm not on the clock. I don't work for the council, and I haven't done anything wrong. I'm not sure why you think you have the right to ask me about my company, but if you must ask, I'm having tea with the queen. Fortunately, I came from a family who ate little worms like him as a late afternoon snack. If he wanted to go attitude to attitude with me, there was no way he'd win, and I didn't care how high up the council he was.
My family wasn't exactly without influence, and I wasn't about to bow down to a self-important, pompous little jerk like him. Besides, if I had, it would have been completely out of character for me, and he would have known right away something was up. He bristled, and I knew I'd struck a nerve. People like him didn't like to have what little bit of authority they had questioned. It's my business because the prisoner just escaped. I just raised my brow at him and kept my expression neutral. I'm sorry, but I don't see how your inability to keep track of your prisoner has anything to do with who's tiptoeing through my tulips. Even if I were the fastest sprinter in the world, and I'm not... There's no way I could have gotten anywhere other than here in ten minutes. I surely didn't have time to figure out where y'all were hiding him, get there, break him out, then come all the way back here and hide him in time to answer my front door for you. He spluttered. You didn't have to figure out where we were hiding him. Blake spilled his guts right in front of you. No, I said in a tone I'd use on a hyperactive five-year-old. All he said was that you were keeping him in one of the employee cottages. We have like a hundred of those on this resort. Now, if there's nothing else, I have some packing to do. His lips curled into a devious smile. So that means you'll be leaving immediately? Crap, he had me there. We emphasized that I was leaving on vacation, but I still needed to be around the resort in order to talk to people. I lifted my shoulder. No, I'm not leaving until day after tomorrow because that's when my boyfriend's vacation starts. He's meeting me here and we're leaving straight through the portals. Not that it's any of your business. So what's the rush to pack? He thought he had me, but not in this lifetime. The rush is because I'm anxious to get out of here. Also, I'm a woman. I pack and repack at least three times before I'm ready. I gave him a smart-ass smile. You know, I want to make sure I pack plenty of tampons and panty liners. You're welcome to come in and help me count them if you'd like. He ground his teeth together. That won't be necessary. Then if there's nothing else, I have things to do. Good luck finding your man. With that, I swung the door shut. How did they get to the front door? Tempest asked, scowling at me. Didn't you have your ward set? Apparently not all of them, I replied, as my heart rate slowed back to something near normal. I did get the warning from the property ward, but they shouldn't have been able to cross it if the other ones were set. The fact that I'd forgotten to set them was a perfect example of why I needed a break. Time to solve a murder and get to it. Chapter 11 What now? Tempest asked, trotting along beside me as I went back to the bedroom. I plopped into the rocker beside my bed and braced my elbows against my knees, then dropped my head in my hands. My first order of business was tracking down the werewolves. The best way to do that would be to take a peek at our guest services log and hope that they'd left cell numbers. The idea of teleporting off the resort made me cringe because that meant I'd have to spend hours tracking down the exact addresses and I was afraid I didn't have that much time. Fortunately, I had access to those records via the management portal so I could use my laptop to run them down. First, we need to find those werewolves. All this ends if they'll come forward and say Jackson was with them. Then what are you waiting for? We could have this wrapped up in 20 minutes and be on our way. She jumped off the bed and scurried toward the kitchen, her tail twitching as she did. With a fresh spring in my step, I followed. Once in the kitchen, I grabbed my computer from the sideboard where I'd left it and plopped down at the table. It only took me a second to log into the Tiki records and track down their names using the room charges they'd racked up the afternoon before. I was frustrated that they'd all checked out, but at least I had their records and could get in touch with them. Even if they were willing to testify over the phone that they'd been with Jackson, that would be enough to stay the process. 
The main downside to what I found was that only three of them had charged things to their room while they were at the tiki, at least in the time period that I'd been there, and I hadn't caught their names since I'd been too busy dodging their stupid football and pulling them off each other. That left two unaccounted for, but the three who had made charges had listed their cell phone numbers at check-in. I pulled my phone from my pocket and dialed the first number. I groaned when it went straight to voicemail, but figured I had two more shots. Hope faded to discouragement when neither of those picked up either. I drummed my fingers on the dining room table, thinking. I had two choices. I could either trek off the resort to their hometown in Michigan, or I could stay here and interview Sandra and Xavier. Since I could only teleport to places I'd been, I'd have to use the resort portal to get me to the town and then use human travel to get me to the exact addresses. That was inefficient and possibly unnecessary if I could figure out why Xavier was lying. Tempest had hopped up on my lap while I was researching, but had gotten bored and decided her time would be better spent watching out the window in case Lester decided to come back. I closed my laptop and stood. I think Sandra is the best place to start. She's the most obvious suspect, so maybe we'll luck out and poke a hole in her armor. I have to figure out how to go about it without letting her know who I am and what I'm doing, though. Let me think for a minute. I know we need to talk to Sandra and Xavier, too. She hopped up on a kitchen chair and twirled in a little circle, then laid down and dropped her head on her paws. Yeah, stealth and subtlety aren't in your top ten for sure. Didn't Blake say something about the spa? I lifted my head and looked at her. You're freaking brilliant. What better way to start my vacation than a spa day? That won't look suspicious at all. As a resort employee, I got huge discounts on all the services we offered, but I never had time to take advantage of them. I'd had a massage a couple times, and they'd been heaven on earth. Unfortunately, I was pretty sure they didn't do group massages, so I was going to have to hope Sandra was in one of the communal areas. Tempest preened. Of course I'm brilliant. Now, we just need to let Blake know where you're going to be so he can keep that squirrely little dude away from you. She closed her emerald eyes for a moment, then popped them back open. There. Done. He said they're going over to the cottage to look for tracks, so he'll try to keep them over there as long as possible. Good, I said with a decisive nod. Then let's get to it. I debated changing from my blouse and cargo caprice into something a little more me, but decided against it. It would be better if I showed up looking like a resort guest rather than a beach bum, even though many of the guests dressed like that. The goal was to get Sandra to confide in me, and I had a feeling showing up in ratty jean shorts wouldn't further that cause. Assuming I even ran into her, that is. I double-checked my appearance in the bathroom mirror and touched up my mascara, noting that it was almost empty. I got the stuff from a witch in Abaddon's gate who made it herself, and it was the bomb. I'd need to grab some before we left. Once I was ready, I glanced at Tempest and worried my lip. I didn't know how to tell her, but she sort of made me stand out. Not that I was internet famous or anything, but if anybody said... Hey, I ran into a redhead with a black and white fox. Does anybody know who she is? Then everybody on the resort would know who they were talking about. Without Tempest, though, I'd be a lot harder to pinpoint, especially as busy as the resort was right now. She looked up at me and scoffed. I already know what you're thinking. Believe it or not, I probably beat you to it. I know I'm unique, so I'm going to go down to the tiki and see if I can eavesdrop on anybody. Also, Bob's been there for a little bit now, so maybe he's heard something. I slipped on my sandals and grabbed my purse. Then it looks like we have a plan. I'll holler if I learn anything, and you do the same. With one sharp nod, she winked at me and disappeared. I decided to follow her example and teleport too, 
After all, I didn't want to waste any more time than I had to, because Blake was only going to be able to stall Lester for so long. Also, unless I missed my guess, we were about to have half the witches' council raining down on our heads because we'd allowed a murder suspect to escape. I frowned, hating that Blake was going to have to take the heat for that, but he was a big boy with broad shoulders. A minute later, I was standing at the employee's alcove on the side of the main building. I hustled around toward Margot and gave her a wave as I passed. I'm going in to see if I can find Sandra, the wife of the guy who got killed. Something tells me she knows where the money came from, and I want to know who made the donation. Not only did I think it was important to solving the case, I also wanted to know who thought they were so important that we could be bought. If I found out, then we could disabuse them of that notion, and I'd take joy doing it. Or rather, telling Ari and watching him do it. Marco nodded. Good luck. She hasn't come this way. Of course, I've only seen her once or twice the entire time she's been here. She doesn't exactly strike me as the outdoorsy, beachy type. If you don't find her in the spa... Maybe check the lounge. She does strike me as a martini type. I smiled at her. Not that I can judge. And besides, if she got a couple martinis in her, she might be more prone to talk. Heaven knows they certainly did that to me. Sheena, a fairy who'd worked there as long as I had, was working the front desk at the spa. Her face lit up when I walked through the door. Hey, Destiny, did you finally come to take me up on my offer of a massage? Sonia's here today, and she's amazing. I was glad she was the one working, because we'd gotten sort of close. She came down to the tiki at least two or three nights a week when she got off work, and she was a southern girl, too. Sorta, I replied, weighing my options. She was a fairy, and they operated outside the realm of the Witches' Council. She also had no love lost for them, because her brother had run afoul with the council when a crazy witch he'd been dating accused him of stealing her stuff when they split up. Finally, she knew Amber and Dax, and possibly even Jackson. When I added all that together, I decided she was worth the calculated risk. I leaned in so that nobody else could hear me, even though we were the only ones in the lobby. Amber and Dax came to me last night, I assume you've heard about the murder? Of course she had. The Enchanted Coast was just like any other small town, in that the only thing that traveled faster than bad news was bad news that was supposed to be a secret. She nodded. I did, and I'll tell you the truth. I don't think Jackson's got it in him to do that. He's a good guy. What does that have to do with you, though? Rumor has it you were going out of town. I waved a hand. They're getting ready to send Jackson off today, and Blake's hands are tied. I gave her a meaningful look, and she nodded. Let me guess, a lot of money, and suddenly there are no other suspects. Her face twisted in disgust, and for just a second, I was ashamed. Not that I couldn't blame her. Of all the supernatural organizations, the Witches' Council was known to be the most crooked. I tapped my nose. Bingo. Got it in one. So that leaves me to save him. There's been a slight hiccup in their plans to take him today, but I'm not sure how long I have even considering that. She leaned her elbows on the counter, her expression conspiratorial. So what can I do to help? I need a few minutes with Sandra Keller, and I need her not to know who I am. Her mouth curved into a smile, and she waggled her brows. Then you came to the right place. Ms. Keller just went into the sauna, and she's the only one in there. You're a freaking goddess, I said, grinning at her. Where do I sign up? She slapped a hand. I got you covered. There's nobody here but me today running things, so I'll just put you down as a comp. Follow me. She stepped from behind the counter and headed toward a set of ornate oak double doors. The vertical bar handles on them were brass, and there were no windows, so the guest's privacy was assured. 
Did you guys get a remodel? I asked, glancing around. As was typical with most spas, at least from what I'd seen on TV, everything in the room was meant to be relaxing. Soft ocean sounds wafted from a surround sound system, and lavender candles flickered from their places on little wicker end tables situated in each corner of the room. The colors were muted, and the eggshell carpet under my feet was thick. One of the benefits of being magical was that you could have light-colored carpets and just magic them clean at the end of the night. I followed her through the double doors. She opened a small closet halfway down and pulled out two plush white towels and a fluffy pink robe with the resort's logo on the right breast. She glanced at my feet and raised a brow. I think this is the first time I've ever seen you in anything other than Crocs or flip-flops, she said, then pulled out a pair of pink flip-flops that matched my robe from the closet as well. Here, she said, handing the stack to me. Go in that room over there and change, then come back out, and I'll lead you to the spa. Or do you know where it's at on your own? I shook my head. No, I've only been here for a massage twice. I never bothered with the steam room because I figure we essentially live in a sauna. If I want that, I'll just stay outside. She grinned. Carol, you and me both. If it's going to be hot and steamy, I want a fruity drink in one hand and an ocean in front of me. Otherwise, I'll take my AC. I stepped into the room and pushed the door shut behind me, then changed quickly into the robe, gathered the towels, and slid my feet into the flip-flops. There was a small bank of lockers in the room, and I popped one open and slid my stuff into it, then twisted the lock and pulled out the key. It was on a lanyard, so I looped it around my neck and headed back into the hallway. That was quick, Sheena said, her tone as perky as her persona. Some people take forever in there, and I have no clue what they're doing. How long does it take to take off your clothes and put on a robe? I assumed that was a rhetorical question, so I decided to use the time it took us to get to the spa to ask a few questions. Does Sandra always come here by herself? Oh, and do you know when they got here? She shook her head as she led me down the hallway toward another set of double doors. No, she was here yesterday with her sister-in-law. Or at least I assume that's who it was. They share the last name, but the woman was wearing a rock big enough to choke a horse on her finger. I'm not sure when they checked in, but she had her first spa service day before yesterday. She's alone today, though? It would be much easier to draw her into conversation if she were there by herself. Sheena pushed a door open and held it so that I could step through in front of her. I was a little surprised at what I saw. For some reason, I'd expected to walk into another hallway, but it opened into a large foyer that had two doors on each wall that led to what I assumed were rooms that offered various types of pampering. She led me to the door on the wall opposite to the one we'd just come through. The sauna's in here. You'll go through a small locker room, then straight ahead until you see the pool. Hang a left as soon as you go through into the pool area, then hang another left. That's where you'll find her. Thanks a ton, Sheena, I said as she turned to leave. She waved a delicate hand at me. No worries at all. Anything to help Amber and Dax. And if I'm honest... To put it to the council. Her face lit up like she'd remembered something. Oh, Sandra has a little Maltese that she couldn't stop talking about yesterday. That might be a good icebreaker. That was helpful. Thanks. I was wondering how I was going to do that, seeing as how I haven't attended very many ten grand a plate charity events in the last few months. I winked at her, and she laughed. Neither have I, darling. I've simply been too busy on my yacht. She pulled off a passable elitist accent, and I made a note to hang out with her more often. I had a feeling she could be one of my people. I pulled in a deep breath as I put my hand on the door and threw a wish out to the universe for luck. I had a feeling I was going to need it. Chapter 12 For some reason, 
I'd expected Sandra Keller to be late middle age and have a little bit of padding. I'd also pictured her as a bottle blonde, though I have no idea why. Instead, she was a slim woman with chestnut hair artfully highlighted and cut in a shoulder-length shag that was currently clipped back from her face and off her neck. She looked up from her gardening magazine she was reading, another surprise, and I was startled at the friendliness reflected in her dark eyes. This was the total opposite of the woman I'd been expecting, at least in appearance. The room was about ten feet by eight and had acacia wood benches lining three of the walls. I slipped out of my robe and hung it from a hook on the empty wall, then made sure my towel was secure before I took a seat on the bench at a 90-degree angle from her. Hi, I said, returning her smile while keeping in mind that she'd just lost her husband. Is it hot in here, or is it just me? I'd found that corny jokes were often a great icebreaker, and it appeared that it had worked. She fanned her face with a magazine, her smile turned to a grin. Boy, is it ever. I slipped in here because I thought it was a little reading nook, but then they tried to cook me alive. You'd think for what they charge for this joint, they'd be able to afford AC in all the rooms. The amusement on her face faded into a combination of sadness and guilt. I knew how she felt. She'd lost somebody she cared about, or at least I assumed she'd cared about him, and she felt bad about experiencing a moment of happiness. Rather than let her dwell on it, I kept talking, keeping in mind that she didn't know me, and I wasn't supposed to know her. How are you liking this place? I asked. What all have you done so far? The resort had so many different amenities that you could stay for a week and never hit all of them. She closed the magazine and scooted a little closer to me so that we could talk without raising our voices. I love it. Or at least I did up until yesterday. That doesn't have anything to do with the resort, though. Or at least I don't think it does. For once, Lady Luck was smiling on me. She brought up the subject right off the bat, so I didn't have to worry about finding a tactful way to broach it myself. I tucked the top of my towel in a little better. I wasn't particularly modest, but I also didn't want to flash a woman I'd just met, especially when I was trying to pull information from her. I'm sorry to hear you had a bad experience. If you don't mind me asking, what happened? Her lips tilted up a little in a sad smile, and a shadow crossed her face. Unless you just got here, I'm sure you've heard about it. My husband was murdered yesterday by a man who cheated him in the casino. I didn't have to fake my frown, though it was for a different reason than she would assume. I hated that she thought Jackson had cheated her husband, both for his sake and for ours. I'm really sorry to hear that, I replied. I did hear about it, and it was awful. That much wasn't a lie, and if she truly loved her husband... My heart went out to her. Now I had to figure out how to be nosy without appearing to be nosy. Fortunately, I'd been raised a southern girl. Digging information out of people that they didn't want to share was genetic. Now I just needed to figure out what I wanted to ask. I wished I'd put a little more thought into that before I'd come, but I hadn't exactly had time to organize a list of interview questions. It is awful. She plucked at the edge of her towel as her chin wobbled and her eyes filled with tears. He was over the top and full of life. My parents didn't like that I'd married him, but I didn't give two hoots what they thought. They expected me to end up with some stick-in-the-mud banker or Wall Street guy, but that's just not how I wanted to spend my life. Marty stole my heart from the moment we met. The goofy man even took my name because he didn't want me to have to go through the hassle of changing mine. With the company, I'd have to change a ton of documents. I didn't detect a trace of insincerity in her tone or her words. It sounds like you found a rare one. I have a really good guy, too, and I'm lucky to have found him. I kissed several frogs before I finally found a prince. I felt a little bad because I was trying to bond with her via shared experience, but I wasn't lying to her. 
Also, my gut was already telling me that she wasn't the one who'd killed him. That meant I was going to have to dig a little deeper. How did they figure out who did it? I asked. It was the money question for me, literally. I wanted to know if she was the one who'd bought the council and slipped the noose around Jackson's neck. She adjusted her robe and set the magazine on the bench beside her. My little brother Xavier saw them in the boat together. Fortunately, the guy was still here, so they were able to arrest him. From what I understand, there's no doubt he's the killer, and the council is taking him today. I guess I got lucky that Xavier happened to be on the beach yesterday morning. Yeah, lucky. The more I talked to her, the more I was convinced she was just caught in somebody else's net. Do you have somebody here so that you're not alone? I was hoping she'd say yes, and again felt a little push of guilt because my motives weren't exactly pure. I needed another suspect, and she'd already said her family didn't like him. Sheena had told me she was here with a woman who was likely her sister-in-law, so I had to wonder if they were there as a family. Maybe there was more than one Keller who was unhappy enough with the marriage to want Marty out of the picture, especially given the amount of money in question. She nodded and wiped a knuckle under her eye to wipe a tear away. Yeah, my brother and sister-in-law are here, and Marty's best friend came with us, too. I swung my legs on the bench, trying to think of a way to ask her if any of them could have killed him without coming out and putting it just like that. Again, my upbringing came to the rescue. That's good, then. I'm sure once they got to know him, they were all just as fond of Marty as you were, so at least you have some shoulders to cry on. We all need that when the world turns things upside down. One corner of her mouth quirked up in a wry smile. I wouldn't go so far as to say they were fond of him. Well, Bobby is. They've been friends for several years. But Xavier, that's my brother, isn't much of a fan. Like my parents, he's convinced I married beneath my station, which I did, but I'm not a commodity. I have my own money, and it's mine to do with as I please. If I wanted to marry a man I love and share it with him, that's my business. A spark of rebellion shone in her eyes, and I didn't doubt for a moment that she meant it. I was starting to feel lightheaded from the heat and knew I wasn't going to be able to hold out for much longer. Sweat was running into my eyes and pooling underneath me, and my towel was almost soaked through. Why on earth people did this for relaxation? I had no clue. I felt like I was boiling in my own sauce. She reached around and pulled a small nylon cooler from the bench beside her, then slid the zipper around and pulled out a bottle of water. You're looking a little flushed. Drink this before you pass out. You don't look like you're used to doing this. I sighed in relief and took the bottle from her. It was ice cold, and I ran it over my cheeks and forehead before twisting off the lid and taking a long drink. To be honest, I'm not. This is the first time I've ever done it, and I'm not sure I'm likely to repeat the experience. That got a laugh out of her. I remember my first time. I felt exactly the same way, but then I saw a real difference in my skin in the way I felt. It's a great way to sweat out toxins and get rid of some water weight. I raised a brow. I actually live here in Florida, so I think I sweat enough to get rid of any toxins just walking outside. I could stand to lose the water weight, but I'm not sure this is the way I want to do it. Still, I'll take your word for it. I struggled to come up with a way to bring the conversation back around to her family. I really needed her to just come out and say her brother hated her husband enough to kill him, but I was pretty sure that wasn't going to be a thing. I decided to come at it from a different angle. At least you have your sister-in-law. I'm sure she understands following your heart. And if Marty was as great as you say he was, I'm sure she loved him too. Us girls tend to see past all that money stuff. I had no idea if that was the truth or not, because I'd never been in the situation where I was friends with somebody rich enough to have enough to worry about that decision. But it sounded good to me. She tucked a loose strand of damp hair behind her ear 
and shrugged. Bella plays her cards pretty close to the chest. We're friends, but she tends to be a bit of a snob. Just because I have so much more money than she does, she'd never come straight out and say she didn't like him, but she's never gone out of her way to be more than socially friendly with him. The only time she ever spoke up was when I gave Marty the family signet ring as his wedding ring. She felt Xavier should have it, but since I'm the oldest, I inherited it. I wondered how that had gone over, but it was obvious she'd stood her ground because Marty had been wearing it in every picture I'd seen him in. Though I already knew, I figured it would be polite to ask. So, what did Marty do for a living? She tilted her head at me, and a trace of amusement crossed her expression. He made me happy. That was all I ever asked of him. When we met, he was working 80 hours a week at a dead-end job as a car salesman just to make ends meet. I went in to have my Mercedes serviced, and I met him as I was browsing the inventory while I was waiting. And the rest is history? I asked, then drained the rest of the water. It felt like I'd gotten all I was going to get from her, and that was a good thing. I was pretty sure I was about ten seconds from death. She laughed, and it sounded genuine. There was a little more to it than that, but yeah, he made me laugh, and he didn't jump all over me trying to sell me anything. In my world, that's rare. He asked me out, and what was supposed to be a coffee date ran on until 11 o'clock that night. He took me to a matinee showing of Casablanca. Then we went bowling. For the first time in a long time, the only thing anybody cared about was whether or not I could bowl a strike. It was refreshing, and I loved him for it. And then the rest was history. I was surprised to find I actually liked Sandra, and I doubled down on my conviction to catch whoever really killed her husband. She deserved that, and so did Marty. I stood and made my way to the door, my legs wobbly. It's been a pleasure, but I can barely breathe. I have to get back out in the cool. Good luck to you, and I'm really sorry about your husband. I pushed through the door and barely made it back to the changing room without falling down because I was so lightheaded. I hadn't noticed it before, but there was a little cooler in the corner of the room stocked with bottles of water and Perrier. I pulled out a bottle of the fizzy stuff and plopped down onto the bench. I'd gotten the information I came for and then some and decided to ask Sheena on the way out where I could find Bella Keller. I had a feeling she'd be much easier for me to crack because I already didn't like her. Chapter 13 Sheena was sorting through files when I made it back to the front desk. I cleared my throat to get her attention, and a wide smile spread across her face when she saw me. So, what'd you think of the sauna? I rolled my eyes. I hated it. I might come back for massages, but I promise you, unless I'm under threat of death or dismemberment, I'll never step foot in that torture box again. She laughed. I feel the same way. But did you find out anything good? I've been thinking about what you said, and it really pisses me off that somebody's trying to manipulate the system like that. Somebody needs to check the council before another agency steps in. The fairy community has been unhappy with them for years, but have so far held their peace. That's not going to continue much longer, though, because this time they targeted somebody outside the witch population. If it's a merman today, it could just as easily be a fairy tomorrow, and that could end an all-out war. I nodded. Yeah, we're used to it in our world, because it's been that way since the beginning. Since council members are appointed rather than voted in, we don't really have a lot of choice. We mostly just work around it by keeping a low profile. Nobody wants to be on the radar. She shook her head, her lips pressed together. That's no way to run a community. Our system follows the old royal bloodline, but major decisions within our community are put to a vote. It's also a governing body that's elected because we have such a large and spread-out population. 
The royals can't handle all that on their own. The upside is that they serve as a system of checks and balances. If it ever comes to the point that royals get out of hand, we have somebody else to turn to. The fairies had a distinct advantage over a lot of species. Some of them had been alive for thousands of years, so they tended to take the long view of things. They also had a much healthier view of the world and believed that personal responsibility included making decisions that were best for the entire community rather than just themselves. The Witches' Council, on the other hand, operated on a transactional basis. Most of what they did was carefully thought out based on power and money. That was a problem for another day, though. Actually, I did get some good information from Sandra, I said, straightening a stack of flyers on the counter out of nervous energy. I don't think she did it. For that matter, I don't think she even knows that anything hinky's going on. That leaves Xavier and Bella. Oh, and apparently Marty's best friend Bobby is here, too. I'll talk to him, but he's at the bottom of the list. From what Sandra said... I feel like her brother has the most motive at this point, and he's the one who lied. Do you have any idea where I might find Bella? She huffed a disgusted breath out through her nose and fluttered her hand. I can tell you exactly where to find her. I'll guarantee she's in the gym. All she talked about yesterday morning was how her body is a temple and that she works two hours a day to stay fit. She rolled her eyes. The hilarious part about that is she was stuffing bonbons in her face the entire time she was getting a pedicure. I laughed. I guess I can't judge. I'd be stuffing the bonbons in my face, too. But I wouldn't be at the gym the next morning. Thanks for all your help. After I get back from vacation, we need to have a girls' night. Her turquoise eyes lit up in delight. I'd love that. In fact, I keep meaning to call you on movie night. But I know you work so hard that I don't want to cut into your time off. The resort had a full movie theater complete with digital surround sound and reclining leather chairs, and on Wednesdays, staff got in free. I waved a hand. Please, interrupt away. You'll be saving me from myself because on the few nights I do have off, I'm usually at home sitting on my butt binge-watching Netflix while eating pizza. She stuffed the files in a drawer and smiled. Nothing wrong with that, but I think we'd have a lot of fun. Good luck with this investigation, and if there's anything I can do for you, let me know. I returned her smile and found that I was looking forward to a night out with her. Will do. I guess I'm off to the gym to torture myself a little more. If I had to make a list of my top ten least favorite activities, going to the gym would be right at the top. Luckily, I got plenty of exercise running back and forth at the tiki. She laughed. Enjoy yourself. I'm sure you'll find Bella to be a real treat. My massage therapist threatened to quit yesterday afternoon after I made her work with her again. I don't think I've ever met anybody so rude and entitled. That lined up with the vibe I'd gotten from Sandra, so at least I wasn't going in with my eyes closed. It was always best to be prepared. With a final wave, I left the spa and headed in the direction of the gym. On my way, I checked in with Tempest through our mental link. In keeping with our current run of luck, she hadn't discovered anything new. She laughed when I told her I was heading for the gym. Have fun with that. I'm getting ready to order a cheeseburger. I scowled because, left to her own devices, she'd fill up on stuff that would end up gassing me out of the house that evening. You wouldn't think a creature that weighed eight pounds could give a toxic waste plant a run for its money, but you'd be wrong. My little fox could clear a room and would be doubled over laughing so hard she wouldn't be able to escape herself. No onion rings. I swear, if you squeak out even the tiniest fart because you ate a bunch of garbage without me there to stop you, I'll toss you out of the house until it clears your system. I'll take that under advisement. With that, she slammed the door to our mental link. I sighed as I stepped into a bathroom next to the gym. I wasn't exactly dressed to sweat, but I didn't feel like running home and changing either. Instead, 
I whispered a few words and cast a glamour, then pulled an elastic out of my purse and twisted my still damp, unruly red hair into a messy bun. That would have to do, because unlike the sauna, I wasn't planning to go for the full gym experience. I'd put in as little effort as possible to make it look like I was there for a workout, but I didn't plan to break a sweat. I glanced in the mirror to make sure the glamour had taken and pulled off my hoop earrings since they didn't exactly match the tank top and bicycle shorts I'd summoned. I didn't take off the makeup, though. I happened to find it humorous when I saw women in the gym with a full face of makeup, but I figured that was probably what I was going into. From what Sheena had said, Bella was high maintenance. That meant she probably didn't go anywhere without her full face on. It occurred to me as I pushed through the gym doors that I had no idea what the woman looked like. For the first time in the last hour, luck was with me, though. Aside from a Bigfoot girl, who looked to be about my age, there was only one other woman in the gym. She was middle-aged, wearing spendy exercise clothes, and, as predicted, her hair and makeup were flawlessly done in gym chic. And, of course, she was on a stair climber. I sighed and headed in her direction, then climbed onto the machine beside her. Lucky for me, it was a one-button deal. Some of the treadmills in the place took an IT degree to operate, and I wanted to look like I knew what I was doing. I had my work cut out for me because she didn't even glance in my direction. I was hoping she'd be one of those women who was chatty while she worked out, but it didn't look that way. That was fine with me, because I excelled at being annoying. It would take a few extra steps, pardon the pun, but I was confident I could get her to talk. Hey, I said as I punched the button to start the machine. There aren't very many people in here, are there? Irritation flashed across her face, but social standards required her to respond. No, and I like it that way. It means I don't have to wait on machines, and I can get through my workout without having to interact with a bunch of people. If she thought I was going to take that hint, she was out of her mind. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of working out in front of a bunch of people either. I just like to come here, get my workout in, and leave. I was proud of myself because I managed to say that with a straight face. She kicked up her pace to a speed that would have gotten her to the top of Everest in record time. If I tried to go that fast, I'd keel over dead in about 15 seconds. I knew it was another hint for me to stop talking, but I wasn't going to give up that easily. I raised my voice so she could hear me over the sound of the stair climber. It's crazy about that murder, huh? This is my first time here, and I wasn't exactly happy about starting my vacation off with a killer on the loose. Her lips curled up. There isn't a killer on the loose. It was one of those heathen mer people. And watch what you say, because the guy that was murdered was my brother-in-law. She was beginning to huff with exertion, and I bit the inside of my lip to keep from smiling. Oh, I'm sorry for your loss. I heard he was a really nice guy. I maintained my snail's pace. I wasn't planning on being sore from head to toe for my vacation just to pull some info from this woman. Realizing that I wasn't going to stop talking, she slowed down. Either that, or she had no choice because she was about to drop dead. I was glad because her face was beet red and I was starting to worry about her. Thank you, she said, her tone and body language stiff. We weren't particularly close, but I suppose you could say he was an okay guy. I know my sister-in-law cared about him, though personally, I don't see what she saw in him. Wow, Sandra had been right. What little respect I might have had for the woman flew right out the window because the fact that she'd tell a perfect stranger she wasn't a fan when she kept her mouth shut to her richer-than-Midas sister-in-law said a lot about her. People in my family had no problem telling each other straight up what they thought about the people we chose to date. It wasn't out of meanness, though. It was all about caring for each other and wanting the best for each other. Well, at least they caught the guy. I did hear that there might be witnesses who say the suspect was with them when the guy was killed, so I'm not sure what the witch's council will do about that. 
I decided to throw that in because I wanted to see how she reacted. She shot me a look that might have killed me had that been possible. That's not the case, I assure you. My husband was the one who saw that man in the boat with my brother-in-law. I lifted a shoulder. I'm just repeating what I heard. She sneered at me. Well, you heard wrong. My husband's testimony is indisputable. She shut off the machine and climbed off it, then snatched her towel and bottle of water off the nearby shelf and stomped away. I stayed on the torture device long enough for her to rush out of the gym, even though my calves were burning. It wouldn't do for her to think I was just there to plant a bee in her bonnet. As soon as she was gone, though, I jumped off and hurried after her. Once I was back in the hall, I flicked my hand to get rid of the glamour and summoned a floppy hat and oversized sunglasses. I was going to follow her to see where she went because unless I missed my guess, she was headed straight to talk to her husband. It was a bold statement to say his testimony was indisputable, and I knew in my gut she had a hand in the cover-up. Now I just needed to find out why. Chapter 14 It seemed all Bella's time in the gym paid off because it was all I could do to keep up with her as she rushed through the hotel. When she stopped in front of the elevators, I wished I knew where she was going. Instead, I was going to have to tweak my glamour and climb into the elevator with her, then hold my breath and hope she didn't recognize me. Thankfully, we were at a magical resort, and if somebody saw me do it, they wouldn't even bat an eye. With a quick twirl of my finger, I turned my hair blue. In my experience, even in the magical world, high society people tended to look the other way because they didn't want to be caught staring at somebody who bucked the norm with colorful hair, lots of tattoos, or piercings. I was also counting on her distaste for small talk. I had to rush to catch the elevator, and even then I barely did. I slammed out my hand to stop the door, then slipped inside and immediately dropped my head and pretended to look at my phone so that the floppy hat hid most of my face. I also pivoted just a bit so that just in case she decided to break character and be chatty, my body language didn't encourage it. Thankfully, my assessment of her character turned out to be right on the money. She jabbed the button for the third floor, crossed her hands in front of her, and kept her eyes glued straight forward. She didn't even glance my way or ask which floor I needed to go to. We rode in silence, me pretending to fiddle with my phone while she looked straight ahead. Once she stepped out of the elevator, I had another dilemma. I couldn't just follow her. She hung a left, and I gave her a couple seconds before I headed in that direction, too. There was a small public restroom situated about halfway down the hall, so I stepped into it to throw her off. I kept the door cracked so that I could see where she went. She stopped at the third door on the left and tapped her plastic key card to the pad, glancing left and right as she did. A man's voice greeted her, so as soon as she went inside, I hustled in that direction. Glancing up and down the hall, I was happy to see that nobody was coming in either direction. Since it was the middle of the day, most people were probably out taking advantage of the amenities, hanging out on the beach, or enjoying the cool environment of the trees and freshwater pools in our new ferry area. Just in case, I tossed a spell on the elevators to temporarily stall them. There wasn't much I could do about the hotel rooms because I didn't want to freak people out if they tried to leave and couldn't get the door open. I'd have to take my chances there. During our teenage years, Myla and I had mastered eavesdropping spells, much to Corey's chagrin. She'd always been the good kid in our little bunch, though we hadn't usually had too much trouble convincing her to follow along with our exploits. She wasn't one who could be pushed around, but she had a huge sense of responsibility and tagged along just to keep us out of as much trouble as she could. As a result of all my childhood practice, it only took me about three seconds to throw up a spell that would allow me to hear what was being said in the room. Stop worrying so much, a man's voice snapped. I took care of the werewolves yesterday. The merman can say he was with them all he wants, but they'll not back him up. 
I sucked in an angry breath. Bingo! Proof that I was right to believe Amber and Dax and my own gut feeling about Jackson. I took a second to glance up and down the hallway. My luck was holding, and it was empty. You'd better be right, Bella said. I paid a small fortune to the council and donated enough money to this resort that they'll be able to build a whole new wing in order to make this go away, Xavier. Ah, so it was Hubby she was talking to. I'd figured so since she had a key to the room, but you never knew. I'd seen more than one spouse slipping into a room that wasn't theirs, so it wouldn't have surprised me too much in this case. I'm aware, he replied, and I could hear impatience and a touch of anger in his voice. Believe me, you haven't let me forget it since this happened. But remember, without my eyewitness testimony, they'd still be looking for a murderer. I raised a brow. Was that a touch of accusation I heard in his voice? Then we'd better stick together, hadn't we? Rather than sounding like she was trying to get him to present a united front, bitterness laced Bella's tone. This was a couple who was beyond even the most intensive marriage counseling, and I wondered how much it would take to get one of them to turn against the other. I realized that was devious, but at this point, I'd take any handhold I could get. Thinking, I decided he was the weak point. I'd already dealt with her, and I couldn't imagine she was going to abandon ship at this point. She had too much skin in the game. Though the witches' council would gladly take a bribe, they owned you after they did. What about Sandra? He asked. She doesn't suspect a thing. Again with the bitterness. Your money is safe, so mission accomplished. That didn't make any sense to me. If they were after the money, why hadn't they killed Sandra instead of Marty? The only thing I could figure was that killing her would have been too much of a risk or wouldn't have accomplished what they were after. As much as Sandra had cared about Marty, my guess was that he'd stood to inherit everything if she passed. Her words floated back to me. She'd said she had her own money and hadn't cared what her family thought. I'd assumed she was from old money, but maybe I'd been wrong. It was also possible that this was step one of a two-step plan for Bella and Xavier. Maybe they'd planned to kill him now so that Sandra changed the will to leave her money to Xavier, then they'd find a way to knock Sandra off in a couple years. If so, that was hardcore. I'm going to take a shower, Bella said, and then go get a massage. I suggest you make yourself scarce until they find that merman and lock his arrest down. Xavier barked out a humorless laugh. Believe me, making myself scarce sounds amazing right now. I'm ready to get this behind us and get out of here. Yeah, but wherever you go, make sure you look appropriately sad. Her voice didn't hold so much as an ounce of sorrow, and I marveled at her utter lack of empathy. We only have to hold it together for a little bit longer, and then we can leave, and you can do what you want. They didn't say anything else, so I assumed the conversation was over. That was confirmed when the door handle twisted five seconds later. Before he could come outside and bust me eavesdropping, I bolted back to the bathroom, thankful it was only a few steps away. There was a small bench in the bathroom for women to place their purses or diaper bags on, and I took a seat so I could process the information I'd just gathered. What really burned my biscuit was that I now knew for sure that Jackson hadn't killed Marty. But I couldn't prove it. Since Xavier and Bella had shelled out a small fortune to make sure Jackson went to jail, it wasn't like I could take my suspicions to anybody at the council. Blake already knew he was innocent, and Ari was incommunicado. Those were the only two people close to me with the power to make them listen, so it looked like I was going to have to find irrefutable evidence all on my own. That meant I either needed to flip Xavier, or one of the werewolves, or find another witness. Since the murder had happened so early in the morning, and nobody had come forward yet to say they'd seen Jackson playing volleyball when he was supposed to be murdering somebody, I pushed that last option out of my mind. 
At least I knew Sandra wasn't guilty. As much as she'd loved Marty, I knew that if I went to her with solid proof, it was possible she'd even turn against her own brother to get justice for her husband. A little jolt of pity washed over me for her. She'd lost her husband, and now she was going to lose another family member and have to deal with the fact that they'd betrayed her in such a horrendous manner. I thought back to Bella's words. She told Xavier she didn't care what he did once they left. I had to wonder if there was more behind her words when she told him that. But that wasn't my problem. I didn't care what they did after they were gone either, as long as whichever one of them killed Marty was in jail and Jackson was free. The question was, which one of them did it? Chapter 15 I took a minute to fill Tempest in on what I'd learned. We decided the best course of action was to track down Xavier. After all, he was the one standing as the witness, so no matter what we could get Bella to say, if he didn't flip his testimony, we still wouldn't have a leg to stand on in our case to clear Jackson. She was still at the Tiki and told me she'd let me know if he showed up there. I also wanted to track down the best friend and see what he had to say, but right now Xavier was the target. My guess was that Bella and Xavier had engineered the entire thing on their own, so I wasn't sure how much I would get from Bobby. I might not have had access to all the bells and whistles of hotel security so that I could easily pinpoint where Xavier had gone, but I had something just as good. I knew people who worked in every section of the resort. I thought about where he might go and narrowed it down to the tiki, the lounge downstairs, Mario's because they had a bar, or the casino. The reason those places made the top of the list was because he seemed like a man who needed a drink. I had a knack for knowing people, so I hedged my bets and trusted my own instincts. Since we hadn't seen him at the Tiki yet and Tempest hadn't mentioned he was there, I knocked that one off the list. I tapped out a quick text to Mario and the bartenders at the casino bar in the lounge. While I waited for the responses, I did a quick search for Sandra on the internet. I needed to know where her money came from and who stood to get it if she died. I had a feeling finances played a big part in why Marty was now dead, so if I could figure out the lay of the financial land there, I'd have a better idea of what might have happened. Most of the stuff I found were puff pieces. I had to dig a little deeper and add some words to my search to find out that the cosmetics company I'd assumed she'd inherited was all hers. She did have family money, but as it turned out, she and Xavier were only half-siblings. They shared a mother, but they had different fathers, and it was Sandra's dad who was rolling in the bucks via oil money he'd inherited from his people. That meant there was a solid chance that Xavier wasn't in the will at all, or if he was, he probably didn't stand to inherit nearly as much as Sandra did. I flipped through a few more articles and found a finance piece about her father dated a couple years earlier. I skimmed the first few lines and realized I'd hit pay dirt. Sandra's father had adopted Xavier shortly after he'd married his mother, so that explained why they shared a name. Xavier had open access to the family money just like Sandra had. A few years ago, though, her father had been all set to retire and had turned the company over to Xavier after Sandra declined. The oil market crashed, and rather than rein in their expenses and sit it out, Xavier, who'd stepped to the head of the corporation by that time, had run it into the ground. Apparently, there had been a big social scandal about that, because even though they were still rich by my standards, they were paupers according to theirs. That just left Sandra's money. Everything clicked into place, and I shook my head. Poor Marty had gone from being a car salesman barely scraping by to a kept man rolling in the dough and living the good life with the woman he loved to be killed by a money grubber. Though I wasn't sure whether Xavier or Bella had been the one to actually strangle him, I was now sure one of them had done it, and they were equal partners in the cover-up. I was startled from my thoughts when my phone dinged with an incoming text, then another, 
then another. Mario and the bartender in the lounge hadn't seen Xavier, but my friend Lily in the casino said he'd already slammed his first martini and was halfway through his second. It looked like I had a solid place to start, and if he was drinking like that, he was a man with a story to tell. I made a beeline toward the elevator and ran all out toward the casino. Okay, maybe running all out is an exaggeration, but I did pick up my pace to a steady trot. When I made it to the casino, Lily was polishing wine glasses. There were several people at the long wooden brass bar, but she nodded her head toward an athletic-looking middle-aged blonde guy hunched over a martini glass at the end. I ditched the blue hair, floppy hat, and sunglasses on my way down because I figured I'd fit in much better without them. This time, I wanted to be seen. I tossed my purse up on the bar in front of the stool beside him and took a seat. Lily came over and winked at me. What can I get for you today, ma'am? I winked back at her and motioned toward Xavier with my thumb. I'll have what he's having. One dirty vodka martini coming up, she said, then turned to head toward the speed rack where the vodka was. I turned to Xavier. Hey, this place is great, isn't it? I got here last night, but so far, I've hit it for a cool grand here at the roulette table, and I had a good time last night at their tiki bar. Have you been there yet? He cast me a begrudging glance before turning his gaze back to his glass, and I thought for a second he was going to flat out ignore me. He didn't, though. No, I can't say that I have. I'm not much of a beach guy. That was funny, considering he had to have been on the beach when he saw Jackson get in the boat with Marty. I let it slide for the moment, though. I don't mean to be forward, but I don't see a ring. Are you here by yourself? Lily sat my martini down on a cocktail napkin in front of me, and I thanked her. He shook his head. No, I'm here with my family. I was hoping he'd be a little more talkative since he was on his second martini, but it looked like I had my work cut out for me. I wasn't even sure where to take the conversation, so I winged it. Yeah, I'm here with my family, too. My mom, my dad, and my sister. Your family must be about like mine if you're here at the bar by yourself. Finally, I got a small, self-deprecating smile from him. He nodded and took another drink of his martini. Something like that. I guess the old saying about not being able to pick who you're related to is true. I huffed an indelicate breath. He got that right. Not only is my sister whiny, she's the baby of the family and their favorite. I'm not even sure why they invited me on this vacation, because it's not like we spend much time together normally. He nodded. I know exactly what you mean. My sister's the family darling, too and I spend most of my time playing second fiddle to her. What about your wife? He hadn't said he was married, so I was giving him a little rope. He gave me a humorless grin and tossed back the rest of his drink. We're not exactly in a great spot. Our marriage has been in a dumpster fire for the past year or two. We had some issues with our business, and it seems like she's not quite as interested now that I'm... Not the person I was when she married me. Funny that he paused before saying he wasn't the same person. I guess it wouldn't have looked too good for a guy to admit he crashed the family business and had possibly driven a gold-digging wife to commit murder and then make him cover it up before she left him. I didn't have any proof of the gold-digging part, but I also hadn't seen anything about Bella having her own money in any of the articles I'd read. Everybody just always referred to her as Xavier's wife or Sandra's sister-in-law. And I had to think that if she had any credentials of her own, they'd have mentioned them. I held my martini glass toward him and clinked his glass with mine. And that's why I'm single. I have yet to find anybody who's interested in me rather than my family money. That seemed to warm him up a bit, and he turned toward me and held out his hand. Maybe Bella wasn't the only gold digger. Xavier Keller, nice to meet you. I accepted his hand, and he held mine a few seconds longer than was socially necessary. I wondered if it was because he found me attractive, or if he was interested in learning more about the family money. 
If I had to bet, I'd say a little of both, with the latter weighing heavier. Sarah Gibbons, nice to meet you. This is my first time here, and I was a little shaken up to hear that somebody had been murdered. Have you heard anything about that? He flinched just a little bit. Yeah, I've heard about it. They have somebody in custody, though, so you don't have to be worried about walking around the resort by yourself. I did my best to school my features. It wouldn't do for me to look surprised. I was, though, seeing as how he'd omitted any reference to the fact that he was related to the guy that was killed or that he was the eyewitness. Oh, I hadn't heard that. I heard that they had a suspect in custody, but that a group of werewolves were playing volleyball with the guy at the time he was supposed to be killing the dude. He whipped his head toward me, and his eyes flashed. That's just a rumor. They caught the merman who did it, so you don't have to worry about it. If you hear anything else like that, ignore it, because there's no truth there. I was bummed. I'd figured for sure I'd be able to get him to crack, but he was holding tight to his story. Since he obviously wasn't head over heels in love with his wife, that made me wonder if he was the one who'd killed Marty. Or maybe he was just in for a penny, in for a pound, because he'd have to admit he was lying if he gave her up. Or maybe he didn't want to stain the family name, though that didn't seem to be much of a priority to him. Still, I found it strange that he hadn't admitted to the relationship. Maybe I'd give him an hour or so to down a couple more martinis and try again. I finished my drink, and when I pulled up my wallet out of my purse, Lily waved me off. You want me to charge that to your room? I grinned at her, because she was telling me she wasn't going to charge me for the drink. It was one of the great things about being a bartender. One hand washed the other, and I'd hooked her up at the tiki a time or two. The resort policy on staff shift drinks was pretty loose since people weren't prone to taking advantage of it. Blake didn't mind if we threw each other a free drink every now and again, and I wasn't about to say no to not shelling out 15 bucks for a martini I hadn't wanted to begin with. That'll be great. Here's your tip, though. I pulled a five out of my wallet and laid it on the bar before I gathered my things and slid off the stool. Good luck with your family, Xavier, and maybe I'll see you around. Leaving so soon? He asked, turning toward me with a disappointed expression. You just got here. My stomach turned in disgust. Not only was he a potential murderer, he was also a cheater. It didn't matter to me that he and his wife weren't getting along. He was still married. So it was slimy of him to act like he was still on the market. Thanks, but I'm going to have to pass. I want to go down and check out the tiki bar, see what it's like in the daytime. I wandered toward the exit, not sure what to do next. That question answered itself when Tempest spoke to me through our link. You might want to come down to the tiki. Bobby just showed up here, and he's looking pretty ragged. You know what they say, when a door closes, a window opens. I'll be right there. I just talked to Xavier, but I didn't get anything out of him other than the fact that he's a slime ball. Well, it's not like that's a shocker. Dimitri is stalling, Bobby, so put the pedal to the metal and get down here. I smiled at her use of language she'd picked up mostly from television. I'm on my way. Hopefully my conversation with Bobby would go better than the one I'd just had with Xavier. Otherwise, I was going to have to track down a werewolf, or three, and see if I could find one whose integrity outweighed his greed. Chapter 16 The moment I stepped outside, it felt like I'd opened a furnace door. It was hot as blue blazes, and between the torture I'd put my body through in the sauna and the gym, and the alcohol I'd tossed on my empty stomach, I was a little queasy. Margot was busy talking to one of the cooks for Mario's, so I just waved at her as I passed. I was kind of glad because I was anxious to get to the tiki bar before Bobby either left or got so smashed he wouldn't be able to tell me anything. Thankfully, it only took me about two minutes to get there, but even so, my shirt was already sticking to my back. 
Since I'd already talked to all the rich folks, I checked to make sure Bobby was still sitting at the bar. Dimitri motioned toward a husky red-headed guy and nodded, so I slipped into the office to change into the spare shorts and tank top I kept there. It wasn't uncommon for somebody, including myself, to spill a drink on me, and wearing a strawberry daiquiri or a pina colada for the remainder of a 12-hour shift was miserable. We had a little bank of lockers where we kept a change of clothes. Once I'd changed and stuffed the blouse and capris into the locker, I headed out to the bar. I was happy to see that there weren't very many people there, despite the fact that the resort was still fairly full. Apparently, the spring break crowd had left, and everybody else was off enjoying some other aspect of the resort. We were often slow through the day except for at lunch, and I was glad to have a quiet space to talk to Bobby. I smiled gratefully at Dimitri as he poured me a glass of his special citrus cucumber water and slid it across the bar to the stool beside Bobby. Thanks, I said, climbing up onto the stool. Would you order me a Philly cheesesteak and fries, too? It's about a million degrees out here, and I just came from the gym. Before that, I was in the sauna, so I feel like every spare drop of liquid in my body evaporated. Dimitri raised a brow at me. He was as allergic to exercise as I was, so I was sure he was wondering what I was blathering on about. Wow, sounds like you've had quite the day. Have you taken up a new fitness routine? I grinned. No, today was a special occasion. I won't be repeating the entire sauna experience, but at least now I can say I've been there, done it, and do not recommend. He smoothed his blue hair back and laughed. Should I get you the t-shirt? Because I feel like if you spent time in the sauna and went to the gym in the same day, you've surpassed your personal record, sugar. I feel like that deserves some recognition. Bobby smiled, though I noticed it didn't quite make it all the way to his eyes. There, there was only sorrow. Yeah, I know how you feel. He motioned to a slightly fluffy form, and this time his smile stretched the rest of the way to his eyes. Most of my exercise comes from lifting 12 ounces at a time. I laughed at his reference to drinking beer. Yeah, mine too. And let me tell you, it's much more enjoyable than anything I've done so far today. With the ice broken, I decided to poke a little bit and see what he'd tell me about the murder. So, I said, after I'd downed half of my water, isn't it awful about that guy who got killed? He picked at the soggy cardboard coaster in front of him, and his voice was soft as he answered. Yeah, awful. I was really starting to wonder if I'd lost my knack for conversation. Everybody I'd spoken to other than Sandra had required a whole lot more work for me than usual. That might have had something to do with the fact that two of them were covering up a murder, though. This man just seemed sad. I heard he was here with friends and his family, I said, reaching across the bar and plucking out a pineapple wedge from the garnish tray. It must be terrible for them. Bobby had his elbows on the bar and was hunched over his drink like a man who was carrying the weight of the world. It is, and yeah, he was here with friends and family. Well, his family and friend, singular. That would be me. We've been tight for almost a decade, and I miss him already. We worked together before he got married and didn't need a job anymore. Dimitri stood in front of us washing glasses. I'm sorry for your loss. At least they caught the guy who did it, right? That has to be some relief. Security here is top notch. I love that man. Bartenders were expected to know everything, and so far, Bobby didn't have a clue as to who I was. The scuttlebutt sounded much more authentic coming from a bartender than it would have from a random stranger. Bobby barked out a humorless laugh. Yeah, or so they say. My ears perked up, and I did my best to keep from showing how interested I was in that statement. Dimitri, on the other hand, had no such qualms. You sound like you're not so sure. Has something changed? Bobby shook his head and hunched back over his drink. Pay me no mind. 
I'm just kind of gobsmacked by the whole situation, and I can't wrap my head around the fact that I'm never going to see him again. Bobby struck me as a guy who was used to talking to bartenders, so I went out on a limb and introduced myself. I'm Destiny. I'm one of the bartenders here. No need to add on the part about being a manager. I didn't want to come across as an authority figure. He nodded his head. Bobby Mackey, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too, I replied. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances, though. This place is really great, and I hate that something so horrible happened to your friend while you were here. He pulled his gaze from his drink and glanced over at me again. Marty would have liked you. He was the sort of guy who'd never met a stranger either, so you two would have had that in common. I wasn't sure if he meant that as a compliment, but I decided to take it as one. Thanks. I'm sure I would have liked him too. I ran into Sandra this morning, and she told me a little bit about him. I figured that was a better way to put it than to confess that I'd tracked her down and stalked her into the sauna. What did you two like to do together? How did you meet? He slugged back the last quarter of his beer and motioned for Dimitri to get him another. I met him on the fishing charter. We were fishing for Marlon, and he caught the biggest one. He sold cars, and I worked on them, so we got to talking. He gazed out toward the ocean, but somehow I knew that wasn't what he was seeing. We exchanged numbers, and everything kind of went from there. We went to the Bahamas together, and while we were there, he found a gold coin. As it turned out, we were far enough out that we were in international waters, so he got to keep it. Dimitri took Bobby's empty glass and replaced it with a full one, along with a fresh coaster. Oh, that sounds like a blast. My boyfriend and I like to take his metal detector down to the beach sometimes. We found a few cool things. Nothing big enough that we can quit our day jobs, but it's kind of nice to make up stories about whose stuff might have belonged to. Bobby grinned. It's funny you mention that, because it's kind of where the coin led. We started researching where it might have come from, and we decided to start looking for some of the shipwrecks that we learned about. For the first time since I'd gotten there, excitement replaced the sadness that had weighed him down. Do you have any idea how many wrecks are out there? Ones that nobody ever discovered? There are people out there who do nothing but that for a living. Some of them have been looking for the same wreck for decades. Honestly, I saw the appeal in it. I watched some documentaries on that, and it looks like something that would be really fun to do. It takes a boatload of money, though. Don't you have to have, like, special radars and all that stuff? He nodded and took a drink of his beer. Yeah, Marty bought us a boat, then equipped it with everything we needed to look for treasures in shallow water. Did you know that Spanish galleons sank in a hurricane off the coast of Florida and dumped the equivalent of a million dollars in gold coins into the ocean when their ships wrecked? My food came, and Dimitri slid it in front of me, along with a stack of napkins. Tempest, who'd been napping in her little bed behind the bar with the fan turned on her, popped her head up, then bounced around and hopped up on the stool beside me. I quirked a brow at her. Didn't you just eat? She didn't bother to tear her gaze away from my food as she answered. Yeah, but that was a cheeseburger. You ordered a Philly. She said that like it made all the difference in the world. How can you possibly still be hungry? I know you probably had key lime pie, too. Dimitri was making a point of nodding his head. And extra pickles. I lowered my brows at her. Did you have onion rings or onions on your burger? Dimitri answered before she could, waving his finger in the air. Oh, hell no. That's what she ordered, but that's not what she got. I can't have her in here running off all the guests. The last thing we need is somebody calling in a hazmat team. Bobby laughed with delight. Oh, Dimitri said, flapping his hand at Bobby. You think that we're kidding and that this is all funny? Honey, let me tell you, that tiny little fox sitting there should have her butt registered as a weapon of mass destruction. 
Tempest snickered, then turned her full attention on me. You haven't answered my question. Are you going to give me some of that sandwich? I shot her a warning glance as I squirted barbecue sauce on my plate. No, I'm not. And if you reach your grubby little paw over here, I'll stick a fork in it. I turned back to Bobby. Please, finish your story about the shipwrecks off Florida that you started before we were so rudely interrupted. I wrapped the arm nearest Tempest around my plate and she glowered at me. That was enough, though, because she jumped off the stool and went back to her bed. With a final glare, she turned three times and lay down. That was about it, Bobby replied, smiling a little as he watched her. We searched around off the coast for a while, but we never found anything more than just a few stray coins here and there. Until recently, anyway. A breeze blew through the tiki, sending my napkins flying. I was a pro, though, and caught them before they got away. I dragged them back over in front of me and tucked them under the edge of my plate. What do you mean until recently? Did you find something cool? Excitement that only another adventurer would recognize sparked in his eyes. We didn't just find something cool. We found something that would change the way we view history. It would have been the biggest find in centuries. I dabbed the beer cheese off my mouth and raised my eyebrows at him. That's a pretty big claim. What exactly was it that you found? He was quiet for a minute, and I was starting to think he wasn't going to tell us. He chose his words carefully. Let's just say that neither of us would have ever had to work another day in our lives, even without Sandra's money. Dimitri wiped off the bar in front of us, sopping up the water lines where condensation had leaked over the sides of the coasters. Not to sound cold, he said, but at least you'll still have that, right? Bobby lifted his shoulder as all the excitement drained from him. He hunched back over his beer. No, I don't have the means to fund a project like that. I'm just a mechanic. I mean... I own my own garage and do okay, but something like I'm talking about would take millions of dollars to fund. Maybe you can find another partner, I suggested. I sort of wished I wouldn't have said it, though. It came out sounding a lot more heartless than it had in my head. He rubbed his forehead. I don't know. Maybe. I need to think about what I want to do, because it really is the find of centuries. He sat there in silence for a few minutes as I ate my sandwich, then glanced at me and slid off the stool. If you don't mind, I'd really like to be alone. With that, he picked up his drink and took it to a small high-top table in the back of the bar. Chapter 17 I'd just finished my sandwich when something vibrated in my pocket. I about jumped out of my skin because my phone was on the bar next to me. I hopped up, barely catching my water before I knocked it over. Shoving my hand in my pocket, I pulled out the conch shell Dax had given me. Sure enough, two seconds later, it vibrated again. What on earth is that? Dimitri who'd been standing in front of me putting glasses in the cooler, exclaimed. I scratched my head as I examined the conch. Dax gave it to me this morning. He said to use it if I needed to get a hold of him. I examined it as it vibrated yet again. Why do you think it's doing that? Dimitri blinked. Don't laugh, but I think you should answer it. I glanced at him to see if he was making fun of me, but his face was serious. I glanced around to make sure nobody else was looking at me. The last thing I wanted was for somebody to see me talking into a conch shell. Once I made sure it was in the clear, I held it up to my ear, even though I felt a little silly. Well, a lot silly. Hello? I asked, my tone hesitant. Oh, thank the gods. Amber sounded like she'd just run a marathon. I wasn't sure you'd know what to do with the shell. I raised a brow, even though I knew she couldn't see me. 
Then again, maybe she could. After all, I was talking to her using a conch shell. Actually, I can't take the credit for that one. Dimitri told me to answer it. I thought he was being sarcastic. Whatever, she said, her tone laced with impatience. I need to talk to you, but didn't want to come up to the bar. Can you meet us at the same spot as this morning? Sure, give me two minutes. The line went dead, and I stared at the conch shell, not sure what to do next. It wasn't like it had a hang-up button. Rather than waste more time on it, I stuffed it back in my pocket. Tempest popped her head up. Do you need me to go with you? I shrugged. I have no idea what she wants, so if you want to go, come on. She scurried around the bar and hopped onto my shoulder, and I headed to the office. Once inside, I closed the door, then snapped my fingers and teleported us to the beach. Amber was there waiting for me in her human form. She was pacing back and forth, and as soon as she saw me, she rushed over to me. I'm not sure what it means, but that silly kraken has been doing the strangest things all day. I tilted my head at her. That's... odd. But what does it have to do with me or the investigation? She ran her fingers through her hair and resumed pacing. That's just it. I'm not sure it has anything to do with you, but I can't figure out what else he's trying to tell us. Tempest jumped off my shoulder and hopped over to a downed log just big enough for the three of us to sit on. She patted the spot next to her. Why don't you sit down and start at the beginning? Maybe we can work it out together. Amber sighed, but did as she asked. Okay, I'm trusting you two with information that literally no land-walking being has, but I don't see another option. Her expression was dead serious, so I didn't drag it out and make guesses and joke around like I normally would have. You know you can trust us. Whatever it is, your secret's safe with us. So let's just get on with what's bothering you. She nodded and scrubbed a hand over her face. Let me start at the beginning. You know that lighthouse he threw at you yesterday? I held up my hand. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm not likely to forget a full-sized lighthouse landing ten feet from where I was sitting, even if it was just a little one by lighthouse standards. She pulled in a deep breath and released it, her gaze examining my face as she did. All right, then, here goes. That was the lighthouse from Atlantis. I laughed, but choked it back when I realized she wasn't kidding. I didn't know quite what to say, so I started with the obvious. Atlantis, as in the mythical lost city? Yep, she replied, nodding her head. That's the one. Tempest sat up on her back legs and rubbed her paws together. I have so many questions, but somehow I have a feeling this isn't the time for answers. What other strange things has the Kraken been doing? I couldn't imagine that it could get much stranger than that, but considering the world I lived in, I wasn't about to say that out loud. Instead, I just waited for Amber to continue. She pulled her long dark hair over her shoulder and wrang the water out of it. He's been bringing us bits and pieces from there since yesterday. We have no idea what he's trying to tell us. Not to point out the obvious, I said. But my guess would be that he's trying to tell you something about Atlantis. No shit, Sherlock. She shot me a look that said I was about one step away from getting smacked. Obviously it has something to do with Atlantis, but what? Why do you think it has something to do with us? Tempest had to hop down in the sand and was pacing. Because Destiny's the one he threw the lighthouse at. Understanding washed over me as the connection clicked into place. Then I guess the obvious question is why me and why Atlantis? What do the two of us have in common? She shrugged, frustrated. We've all been trying to figure that out since yesterday. The only thing you have in common is the murder. That doesn't make much sense either, though. I picked through everything I'd learned over the last day and a half 
and realized the only conversation I'd had that could be remotely linked to the ocean was the one I'd had just a few minutes before with Bobby. My heart sank because I really liked the guy. What? She snapped. I recognize the look on your face. You've thought of something. Tempest nodded before I could say anything. She did. We did. What are the odds that somebody found Atlantis? Amber sighed. Not good, but it's not impossible with today's technology, I suppose. People have looked for it for centuries, but now all those hardcore people looking for treasure or to just prove that the legend is real have the tools to dedicate to the project. Why? I pressed my lips together, not happy to be the one to tell her. Because I think maybe it happened. Marty and his best friend were treasure hunters. Not ten minutes ago, Bobby was telling me about how they'd found something that was going to change history. He called it the find of centuries. Plural, not singular. Maybe he was talking about Atlantis. Amber chewed on her lip, thinking. So, you think maybe this guy killed his best friend so that he could have the treasure of Atlantis all to himself? That doesn't make any sense. Tempest ran her paws through her tail, something she did when she was thinking. He flat out admitted that he didn't have the money to fund the project. Why would he kill the golden goose before it laid the egg? I stood from the log, needing to move so I could think. There's only one person that can answer that question, and he's sitting at the tiki slugging back beers as we speak. Tempest jumped on my shoulder, and I held up my hand to snap my fingers and take us back to the tiki. Before I could, though, Amber grabbed my arm. I'm going with you. This involves my people, and I need to get to the bottom of it and do damage control if I can. We don't want people finding that city. I held out my elbow. You better get a good grip, then, because we're about to take the fast track. Chapter 18 I teleported us back to the office, and as soon as we landed, Amber bolted toward the door. I reached out and grabbed her arm before she could storm the castle, so to speak. We need to do this right. For one, if he really does know where Atlantis is, you're going to be nice to him. For another, if he did kill his best friend, I'm not sure why. He truly seems broken up about his death, so maybe it was some kind of horrible accident. Amber was always so lighthearted and friendly that I forgot how vicious mermaids could be when I was around her. Yes, they were beautiful women who swam in water, but they'd also lured many a man to his death, at least if the legends were true. Looking at Amber now, I was a little more prone to believe them than I had been an hour ago. The fierceness drained from her expression, and she sighed. You're right. My first instinct is to defend our heritage with everything I have, but charging out there and demanding answers isn't the best way to do that. There was the Amber I knew and loved. No, but let's go see what he knows and go from there. I might have it all wrong. She paused and examined my face, and I felt like she was crawling right into my skin. Do you really think you do, though? I shook my head. No, I don't. But I've been wrong before. Convinced she wasn't going to walk out and tear the poor guy's head off, either figuratively or literally, I opened the door and led the way to where Bobby was sitting at the far table, all by his lonesome. He was so lost in his own thoughts that he either didn't hear us come up or didn't care. Either way, he didn't even bother to look up until I rapped on the table with my knuckles. I said I wanted to be alone. I'm not sure what part of that you didn't understand. His tone was laced with bitterness, but I didn't pick up any real anger. This was just a man that was hurting. Amber slid up onto a stool beside him. Believe me, I wish I had the luxury to let you sit here alone and drink yourself into a stupor. I don't, though. I need to talk to you about what you and your partner found. He glanced at her through his lashes, but he did lift his head. 
We didn't find anything. If someone told you we did, they were lying. He was starting to slur his words, but he wasn't dead drunk and beyond comprehension. I took the stool next to him and across from Amber. No offense, but you're lying through your teeth. You either lied to me earlier or you're lying to me right now. But either way, we're going to get to the bottom of this before any of us get up from the table. He glowered at us with an unsteady gaze. Maybe he was walking a little more sideways than I'd initially thought he was. You wouldn't believe me even if I did tell you what we found. You'd just call me crazy like all our potential investors did. And frankly, I don't want to hear it. Amber laid her hand on his arm. Try us. I think you'll find we're a little more flexible than what you're giving us credit for. A breeze flitted through the tiki, ruffling his hair so that a lock of it fell over his eyes. He shoved it back and sighed. We found Atlantis. Amber tensed, and I sent a quick wish into the universe that she wouldn't lose it right there where she sat. Much to my surprise, she just stared at him for a few seconds. Where is it? He scoffed. You're out of your mind if you think I'm going to give you that information. What? You think you can just go over there and steal all the treasure and credit after we did all the work? Amber reached over to him and took his chin between her thumb and forefinger, then forced his face up so he had to look at her. Once he did, her eyes flashed the brilliant color of her luminescent turquoise tail. Once she was sure he'd gotten the message, she let go. I hadn't realized she'd been holding him immobile until she released him. He snapped back in the stool so hard that he almost tripped over backwards, and I grabbed a hold of his arm to steady him. Tempest jumped from the floor to my lap to the table. Maybe you should just tell us what we want to know. It'll make things easier on everybody. Bobby hadn't taken his eyes off Amber, though. What are you? The color drained from his face as he realized the answer to his own question. I sighed. Like I said, it would be best all the way around if you just answer the question. He nodded and rattled off coordinates, and it was Amber's face that paled this time. You really did. Did you just stumble upon it? There's no way you did that. We have that place so warded that nobody should have been able to find it. Our secret's been safe for centuries. He scooted his stool a little closer to me. One of his friends just equipped his research boat with a bunch of new high-tech magical sonar. I'm not exactly sure how it works, but we were puttering around fishing, and it lit up like the 4th of July out of the blue. We stopped to see what it picked up. Imagine our surprise when we jumped in his buddy's little zillion-dollar mini-sub and found your city. Is that what the Kraken had been trying to tell us? Just that somebody found the city and that they were at the resort? I didn't believe that. I also had zero proof to prove anything otherwise. Bobby turned a bitter gaze to Amber. I suppose you don't have to worry about anything now. The guy who had the money to fund the project that would have set me up for life is dead. And I'm not about to spill the secret when there's no way anybody would pay me nearly what it's worth to me. It made me sad to hear him say that because it reaffirmed all the bad things I believed about people. Because I was friends with Amber and Dax, I understood why they didn't want other species scavenging the city that gave them their birth. Had I not known them, I would have looked at the discovery through a whole different lens. To me, it would have been a wondrous thing, and the historical and cultural values of it would have way overshadowed the financial gains of whoever had found it. Before I could ask him anything about the murder, he shoved away from the table. If you'll excuse me, he slurred, his eyes slightly out of focus. I think I've made it pretty clear that I want to be alone. He stumbled around the table and caught his toe on one of my stool legs. I reached for him, but I was too slow, and I cringed when he crashed to the brick floor of the bar. Hopping off my stool, I reached down to help him up. Just leave me alone, he growled, shoving my hands away. I held my hands up. No problem, buddy. You're on your own. 
Just don't fall in the ocean and drown. I think we've had enough of that for one week. If he could have set me on fire with his unsteady glare, he would have done it. He staggered to the bar and stuffed his hand in the pocket of his khakis. Here, Dimitri, this is for you, but put my beers on my room. He pulled some cash from his pocket, and when he did, something else came with it, making a clanking noise as it hit the floor. Sun glinted off gold as it rolled toward me, and I bent over and scooped it up. I glanced down at the large signet ring in my palm and realized that I'd had it all wrong as the pictures from the society pages flashed through my mind. This ring was a dead ringer, and since it had the family crest, I doubted there was another. Xavier hadn't killed Marty, and neither had Bella. I wasn't sure why they'd covered it up, but the killer was standing right here in front of me. He tried to snatch it back from me, but I stunned him with a little bit of magic. Go get Blake, I told Tempest. Tell him we've caught the real killer. She had no sooner disappeared when the two people I thought were killers made their way around the corner of the tiki. When Xavier and Bella observed the scene in front of them, they spun to run. Things happened so quickly at that point that I had a hard time keeping track. I flung out my hands and stunned them too, and Dimitri used his own brand of magic to float them back into the tiki and toward the office before they could raise an alarm. He did the same with Bobby, and once they were all secured, I sat back to wait for Blake. Two minutes later, he popped in, a scowling Lester in tow. He flicked his wrist to reverse my stunning spell, then glared at the three of them. Somebody needs to start talking, and right now. All three of them sat there, their lips sealed as they glared at each other. Thunder boomed so loudly that it shook the entire building, and the accompanying lightning was brilliant. My lips curled up into an evil, self-satisfied grin. The boss was here, and his timing couldn't have been better. Ari appeared in the office, and his beefy six-foot-five frame filled the room. The angel of water emitted a blinding glow as he raked his hands through his golden hair. He nodded at Blake, then at me, and his gaze softened by just a fraction when I smiled at him. That only lasted for a second, long enough for him to turn toward the trio magically trussed up on the floor. He pointed at Xavier, and a zap of magic shot from his finger. Speak, and let nothing but the truth flow from your lips. Xavier shook where he sat, and I was pretty sure he wet his pants, not that I could blame him. I lied. I didn't really see that mermaid get in the boat with Marty, but if it got out that Bella had killed him, we would have been ruined. Bella practically fell off her chair as she whipped around to stare at him. I didn't kill him. I thought you did. That's why I paid everybody off. If you go to jail and lose everything, what would happen to me? My stomach flipped in disgust. She really didn't care that a man had died. She only cared about not losing all her fancy clothes and expense accounts. It seemed we had a quandary, except I knew the truth. I turned my attention to Bobby, who appeared to be trying to shrink himself into as small a ball as possible. Bobby, do you have anything you'd like to say? I asked, crossing my arms. He shook his head, but Ari, whose expression was the exact opposite of patient, flung his arm out. Magic wrapped around his arm, then flew off his fingertip and zapped Bobby. Speak! He boomed, and the light fixtures in the room shook. All right! Bobby squeaked, holding up his hands. No more. I killed him. But it was an accident. I raised my brows at him. How do you accidentally strangle someone? He huffed out a breath. We were arguing. We'd gone out early yesterday morning to go fishing, and we were talking about what we were going to do about Atlantis. He'd asked Sandra for money, and she'd told him she'd have to think about it. It was a big chunk he was asking for, but I'm sure she would have come around. So how do you go from fishing and talking about Atlantis to having your hands around his neck choking the life out of him? I asked. He sighed and closed his eyes. We got in a fight. He was having second thoughts because he'd spent some time with a merman in the casino. 
It changed the way he saw things, and he thought maybe we should leave Atlantis alone. He was willing to just walk away from all of that because he'd realized what it would probably mean to the mer people. He was also taking this big swing toward environmental responsibility. He put that in air quotes. And he was worried about what would happen to the ocean life if we pursued it. I just got so mad at him. We'd found the golden ticket, and he was willing to just let it go. One minute we were wrestling, and the next, I was on top of him. By the time I realized what I'd done, he was already dead. So, you robbed him and threw his body out of the boat? Blake asked, his expression disbelieving. Bobby looked him right in the eye. I'm not proud of it, but yes. The ring is enough to pay my bills for years, but it's just a drop in the bucket to Sandra. If it hadn't been for that, I might have felt a little sorry for him. As it was, all I felt was disgusted. Blake rushed forward and slapped magical cuffs around his wrists, then summoned security. Bella's check must not have cleared yet because Lester, who surely saw all that donation money disappearing, held his hand up and started to say something. Ari spun on him, and the squirrely little man shook like he'd just come out of a freezer. You and I are going to have a long conversation. As a matter of fact, I want you to summon the entire council. We're going to set something straight once and for all. This resort isn't for sale, and I'm no longer willing to cooperate with them if that's what they think. Since Bobby had confessed, there was nothing left to do but declare that Jackson had been exonerated. Ari made that call because even after his interaction with Lester, the councilman hadn't spluttered about the ruby ring Jackson had stolen. I wanted to be the one to tell Sandra, so as soon as all the hullabaloo was over, Ari and I went to talk to her. Destiny, she said, her eyes red from crying when she opened the door. What can I do for you? I'm sorry to bother you, and even more sorry to have to be the one to tell you this, I said. But Marty's murderer was caught. That's good news. She replied, though her tone was listless. Where was he hiding? Ari stepped up and introduced himself. That's just it, ma'am. It wasn't Jackson after all. He sighed. Destiny found conclusive evidence that Bobby Mackey killed him. Then Bobby confessed. Her hand fluttered to her chest and the blood drained from her face. Please, come in. I think I need to sit down. She swung the door open, and we followed her in, then took a seat at a small table in the suite. I dreaded telling her the rest, but it wasn't like we could hide it from her. That's not all. Xavier and Bella were involved in the cover-up. Bella made a sizable donation to the Witches' Council in the resort, and Xavier lied about seeing Jackson with Marty. Sandra swallowed, and I jumped up and got her a water from the mini-fridge. Thank you she said, her manners prevailing even though she was shaken to her core. Her tortured gaze flickered between Ari and me. I'm so ashamed. How could I ever make it up to you? Ari leaned forward and put his hand over hers on the table. You have nothing to be ashamed of. You are a victim here, and I want you to know that you're welcome here free of charge any time you want to come back. I know it might bring you painful memories, but I'd like the chance to offer you happy ones, too. A little of the sadness and exhaustion seemed to leave her face, and it was then that I noticed the slightest glow coming from her hands. He was giving her his healing energy, and my respect for him grew. Despite the common misconception, not all angels were good, there were shades of gray with them, just like there were with all people. Thank you, she replied. I think I'd like that, and so would Marty. We were only here for a couple of days, but he loved it. We said our goodbyes and left, and I felt a little bit better when we did. I nudged him with my elbow as we made our way down the hall to the elevators. That was a sweet thing you did back there. He glanced at me. 
Nah, offering her a free stay anytime she wants to come is the least we can do for her. I shook my head. That's not what I meant. I saw what you did when you put your hands over hers. His cheeks pinked a little, but he smiled. I hated that she was suffering when I had the power to take a little of that away from her. You know something? I asked, looping my arm through his. I know a lot of things, but I don't know what you're referencing in particular. His mouth quirked up in a grin. Then let me enlighten you. No pun intended. You're okay for an angel. He pushed the button to call the elevator. And you're all right for a witch. I think we make a pretty good team. Chapter 19 After the dust had settled and everybody was gone except for Ari, we bellied up to the bar and ordered a couple of beers. I nudged him with my elbow and gave him a sideways grin. Way to blow in here all thundery and glowing to put the fear of gods into everybody. He grinned back and rubbed his face. Sometimes an angel's just got to make an entrance. His face turned serious. I'm going to have to deal with the witches' council, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do about that. I need to make it crystal clear that I won't tolerate them ever pulling anything like that with this resort again, but I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do that yet. His blue eyes glittered, and for just a second, I felt a little bad for all those high and mighty folks who thought they were above reproach. But that only lasted for a second. After that, I was giggling in delighted glee just imagining what he could do to them if he wanted to, and I'm sure they wouldn't be so joyous about it. Please tell me you're going to let me go with you as a representative for the resort. You have no idea how badly I want to see you take them down. Why, Ms. Maganetti, he said, pride etched across his features. Is that a little bloodlust I'm hearing in your tone? I laughed. No, that's a lot of bloodlust you're hearing in my tone. Those people have needed taken down for years, and nothing would make me happier than to get to see karma in action. Well, he said, clanking his glass on mine. Karma probably won't be there, but I will. You're welcome to go along for the show. And not for nothing, but I really hope you're thinking about the job offer. You'd make a great angel someday. Ever since shortly after Cassiel, the angel of temperance, had been murdered, Ari'd been after me to take the job. After all, in angel years, an entire human lifetime was a blink. To me, though, it was my entire existence and I wanted to let it play out before I decided what I wanted to do once it was over. Since I didn't know what would happen over those decades, I didn't want to make a decision now that I might regret when it was time. I lifted my shoulder. I've thought about it, but considering the first job requirement is that I have to be dead, I'm hoping I have a little bit of time to make my decision. He tilted his head and smiled. Trust me when I say that you have plenty of time, but when you're ready, we'll welcome you with open arms. We turned and put our backs against the bar and watched as the sun slipped behind the horizon over the Gulf of Mexico. In two days, I'd had a lighthouse thrown at me by a kraken, solved a murder, and cleared a merman's name, found out Atlantis was real, and drunk a beer with an angel. My life was strange, but I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. This has been Mangroves and Murder, an Enchanted Coast Magical Mystery, Enchanted Coast Magical Mystery Series, Book 5, written by Tegan Marr, narrated by Megan Kelly, copyright 2021 by Tegan Marr, production copyright by Tegan Marr.